coming right there. I like that title, Tactical Rifleman. <laughs> Sounds All right, like hey guys, uh, welcome back to Tactical Rifleman. We're here <laughs> doing our our uh, live stream slash podcast. I guess we could we could call this a podcast, couldn't we? The cool part is we actually have a sponsor tonight, John. We do it is Nutrient Survival. Kind of kind of cool stuff. Uh, you guys are not familiar with Nutrient. I actually got one of their variety packs right here. Very good. Um, so they do they do the number ten cans of survival food stuff. Stuff lasts for like twenty years, but in twenty five years, twenty five plus years, the cool part about these guys is instead of them being empty calories. Uh, it's actually good food, all the amino acids, vitamins, minerals, everything you need. So they took all the survival food and pumped it all up into being, hey, if I was an operator, maybe not Mac V SOG level, but maybe if I was a lowly fifth group <laughs> Green Beret operator in like the global war on terror, if I had to go up on the mountain in Afghanistan, right. I'd want to be putting good food into my body. So anyways, Nutrient Survival, there was some, when they heard, John, I was going to have you on... Uh, they jumped at the chance. They're like, hey, we want to sponsor this Well, we thank stream. them for that. They're good people. Uh, matter of fact, gents, if you want to, if you're interested in uh, nutrient survival, again, good stuff. The promo code is TR10. Go to their website. Use TR10. Saves you 10% off of everything. What a they deal. They did that for me. Works for you, John. Well, oh, maybe yeah. not for you, but Soon it'll I work for home. everybody out there. Works for everybody out there. All right. Um, so real oh, quick. Show. Because this is actually going to be a podcast. Chad, you recording this? Yeah. Chad is recording. Chad right. is on the job. All right, so I'm going to start this again. Let's do it. All right, let's do it again. Act like you're in charge. All right. NCOIC. We prefer MFIC or the <laughs> HMFIC. All right, hey, gents, welcome back to Tactical Rifleman. As <laughs> promised, I have got for you the legend, the American icon um, there's just, there's so many words to describe this, Greg. I, I consider him not just an American hero, but I, I, John, I'd like to call you a friend too, brother. You're, well, you're good friend people. for sure. We're there. Uh, for sure. Gents, this is John Stryker Myers, known to all of his friends back in the day as Tilt, uh, Mac V. Sog, Vietnam veteran, and uh, brother, we've had you on the show before, and I was like, man, we're never going to see him again, Chad. He's never going to come oh, back. Oh, no, I'll but the, but the reality <laughs> is uh, we had a great show, and everybody's like, man, Carl, you've got to bring this guy back. You've really? Bring him back. Gotta well, bring him I'm back. honored to be here, so, and you, you forgot... I'm just a lucky, more of a survivor than a hero. Um, in my yeah, humble opinion. yeah, no, there's <laughs> like that, all of us. Yeah, uh, with, without a doubt, without a doubt. Um, <clears throat> I have been getting nothing but just hit up over and over and over again. There's lots of people out there that have got great questions for you. Uh, some of them have been passed in ahead of time. I've made it through just these two books. I know you, you've been involved with a bunch of other ones. Just three, that's all. Um, but uh, the, the big thing's not your books now. You're doing, you're doing podcasts now, too. Why don't you tell us a little bit about them? You're doing them with Jocko? We are. There's a Navy SEAL that some folks been. He was on Fox News last yeah. night. Okay. And uh, so Jocko was a Navy SEAL, a 20-year career man. Went from enlisted to an officer and had two tours of duty in Iraq. The second tour of duty was 06. And uh, he was the OIC for uh, officer in charge of Task Force Bruiser okay. when they retook Ramadi. Yeah. He lost good people there. Mm -hmm. And he worked with SF, the Marines, the, I think the 10th Mountain Division was there. And uh, so he had that experience and from it, he's an English major on top of it, very literate. Okay. And so my Ali, my wife, had listened to a couple of his podcasts he'd done on Jordan Peterson, who we all mutually respect. Okay. And she said, oh, this, this Navy guy downtown is doing these things. And then uh, one of the uh, brothers of one of our SOG KIAs said, you've got to meet Jocko because he's done interviews. And he hasn't done any on, any on SOG yet, which, of course, was our eight-year secret war in Vietnam, yeah. which had the highest casualty rate, which we didn't know about until later. And uh, so we talked about it back and forth. So finally, my buddy, Jim Suber, and his son, Sent a book to Jocko, and 
eight months from our first discussion. Then Jocko had to cancel once. I had to postpone. And finally, June 5th, 2019, we did our first podcast with Jocko. And you've done how many of them with me? Eight now. Eight. Yes. But he's... Um... And I'm saying Jocko's great. I've never met him personally, but I've really? heard nothing but great things about him. Um, Come to the SFA reunion in October in Vegas. He's be, he'll be there. He's going to be one, okay. of, one of the guest speakers. Uh, um, but for sure, he runs great podcasts. I've watched some of his podcasts, and you guys know I don't watch the internet. So, but it, 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 <laughs> no, I don't. I just I don't watch the internet. If I need to learn how to clean my espresso machine, I I pull up a video on it. But um, <laughs> Yeah, so that's where I've that's where I watch you. That, I watch your podcast with Jocko, and I'm like, I'm just completely sucked into this. Jocko, likewise, was so blown away by you, John, that now <laughs> he's got you doing your own podcast, well, yeah. interviewing who? We're, we're interviewing fellow SOG veterans, men that have survived the ordeal or are still alive, and uh, we're telling each of their stories. How do my viewers get to those? Where are you putting those up? Well, um, I said, what's what's a what's an O what's an O four in, in Navy talk? O four lieutenant I, commander can't call him a captain because no, no, there's that's, only that's, one that's, captain that's on that's a boat. That's an O six, yeah. Um, but anyway, he's a he's a, he's the they're, they're all charge. seamen to me, dude. They're all <laughs> seamen to me. <laughs> okay, but right. his 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 podcast, my world has changed since June fifth of twenty nineteen. It has exposure. It's the social media aspect. Mm -hmm. People have responded to it. And I've always believed our stories were extraordinary. But since appearing with him, I've had contact with literally soldiers around the world from every different era, from World War II through to today's contemporary wars and folks from your generation. Mm -hmm. and, and everybody's like so respectful. And they, when they learn about our stories, um, it's very humbling. They go... You guys were crazy to be doing these missions in Saga. Well, yeah, it was a prerequisite. You had to be <laughs> you had to be fifty one fifty, which is you know, it's the California code for being just a little bit off your rocker. But um, so since then, we've had other podcasts, and uh, it's just been amazing. But this way, it gets the stories out first of all, mm -hmm. um, and through those podcasts and his other social media, his books and his classes. Uh, sometimes we come up, and even in his classes, when he's talking about leadership and quality. Mm -hmm. um, so it's been an amazing experience. And there are people now, young people, that can hear the stories. Of, and I've met now over a dozen young men that are either signing up for the prequal for Special Forces, mm -hmm. or they're in the qualification, that, that is, or in awesome. the prequal, awesome. or they're now Green Berets. At a group. Yeah. And it's like, hey, wait a minute. That's, this makes it all worthwhile. It's a we, bonus. We talked at dinner about, um, you know. What how, movie did you see? Yeah, exactly. Yeah. <laughs> we, we were talking about what movie blew him away. And I uh, talked about how me seeing the, uh, the, the movie Green Berets with John Wayne. John Wayne. Because uh, I didn't see it till I was in junior high school, Saturday afternoon, matinee. That's when I decided... I want to be a Green Beret. How many kids in junior high school know what they want to do? Fast forward, you couldn't go Special Forces until you were E5. So I knew I had to be in the regular Army for a few years. I wanted to be what a year Green that? Beret. 1985 is when I graduated really? high school. Joined school. when I was 17. Um, so I went infantry mm -hmm. because I wanted to be a good Green Beret. So I'm in the infantry, and I, I know I'm going to be a Green Beret, but... All that time in the infantry, I was in a recon platoon, was never in a line company. Uh, but no matter where I was at doing recce missions, this, that, and the other, uh, you know, you study, you do everything else. But my heroes then weren't John Wayne. My heroes then were reading the stories, the after action reviews of everything from this small group of guys called Mac V. Sog. And Soldier so, of Fortune. The yeah, Soldier of Fortune was where you read a lot of, of those stories. And you, and you ever, if you remember <clears throat> the correspondent named Isaac Stoltz? I don't, that's I'm okay. terrible it's with a names. Long time ago. All you that's crackers okay. look alike to me. I know. Well, that's, that was my pen name. I no start, shit. Yeah. You were writing stuff in Soldier of Fortune magazine. Yep, the first, not the first, but <laughs> Amongst the first, and we actually did the first. Wow! And some of them, I later turned them around, expanded them 
for across the fence and on the ground. Wow. Yeah, me and Robert, no K, Robert K. Brown, we go way back. Because <laughs> I saw Soldier of Fortune magazine, my little brother lived in Denver and my sister lived out there. And uh, I picked up Soldier of Fortune. They had the one edition where they talked about Sog. And I go, I got to meet this guy. So Robert K. Brown, yeah. Soldier of Fortune. He's proud of the fact he's the only officer, Green Beret officer, that was thrown out of Vietnam twice. <laughs> How do you get thrown out of Vietnam? Because right, I hear, um, I went to a funeral once, and this is before the towers fell and everything, and there's all these Green Berets there from the local chapter. They're all Vietnam vets. Right. And they're looking at my uniform, because we're in class A's, you know, it's a yeah. funeral. And they're looking at me, and I'm like, you know, I got my CIB from when I, sure. Desert Storm, from eating MREs for seven months. <laughs> and uh, and they're looking at me, and they're like, what is that? And I'm like, uh or that's a CIB, and they're like, not the C not the CIB. Uh, underneath that, what is that right there? And they're, I'm like, that's a good conduct medal. And it, in the oh. Army, everybody gets a good conduct medal. You don't even have to try. No, no, no. They give it I, to you every four years. I didn't get one. Exactly, exactly. I didn't know this. <laughs> I didn't know this. My whole time in the Army, uh, you owe it every four years, you got your good conduct medal. Well, these Vietnam... Guys, th these Green Berets are chewing my ass. They're like, what do you mean you got a good conduct medal? How dare you get a good conduct? I'm like, what the fuck are you talking about? They, these guys would steal Jeeps, right? They would, um, from the MPs, mind you, from the military police. Or general. Or the general. Uh, start fights in bars. Uh, smuggle no. uh, the prostitutes on the base. One group, I guess, tried to bring this one girl home on the C-130. <laughs> she was in a duffel bag. You don't get kicked out of Vietnam for doing that. Or he may How be, do you get kicked out of Vietnam? He, or he may be kicked out of his command. But Bob <laughs> hasn't told me that story now in 30 years. And my synapses may be guilty of shrinking a little. But he's one of my heroes, you know. And he's always been big on the POW MIA thing in yeah. his spare time. He put a lot of money into it oh, back yeah, in the 80s. Oh, yeah, without a so. doubt. Yeah, so um, around about 80, 86, 87, oh, 86, I was out in, in Denver visiting my brother. We went down to SOF headquarters, walked oh, in. Because back then he had this big office. Mm -hmm. They had dozens of writers and people to put the magazine together. And they yeah, were there all were, There was no internet. There was no. very little in, uh, in the movies even back then covering right. all that. Everything. Sure. You wanted anything about this subject, you went to Soldier Fortune magazine. Yeah, and Bob was just a go-getter. And so we met, we talked, and uh, I said, look, I'm working at a newspaper. If they know I'm writing for you, my days are numbered. Mm -hmm. So, you know, I'm married, I got a kid. Uh, they like to eat yet. So can we use a nom de plume or a nom de gere? And we came up with uh, Isaac's thoughts, which was my, uh, is a, my two uncles. Okay. So... <laughs> Yeah, they're from the old Dutch side of the family, you know. No joke. So if we've yeah. been through some old the Sword, Soldier of Fortune magazine. Yeah, oh yeah. You'll, you'll see it because those bylines are there. I got some at home. They're, they're, well, actually, they're still <laughs> packed. My wife and I moved to Tennessee, and we still yeah. got 40 boxes in the garage. Uh, it's what, not her fault. It's mine for what, not getting them all packed. What made you decide to leave uh, California and move back to America? Californication? Yeah. What, um, what made you come back to America? We came back, well, for, it started with our, with our girls. <clears throat> our youngest girl came out two years ago looking for a property. Okay. She was engaged at the time. And Anna goes, we're done. We're done with California. And I said, I couldn't argue. That and is, that the, is the so one party, cool. the corruption, the taxes, and, you know, the uh, illegal aliens have more rights there than yeah. the taxpayers do now. It's sad. And now um, they're going to get paychecks from... Uh, Governor Gruesome. Now I know we have, we actually have a lot of viewers from uh -oh. California. No. So uh, for those of you out there uh, beh deep behind enemy lines in California, <laughs> I, I just wanna I just wanna say the chair is against the wall. Indeed. The chair is against the wall. John has a long mustache. John has a long mustache. mustache. I encourage you guys to immigrate back to America. And, mm. Dude, I'm so glad you did. When I found out that you, dude, you live an hour and a half away. That's it. Hour 70, and a half. 73 and a half Three. miles. We're here. Mm -mm -mm. Bing. So, yeah. And uh, so we came out, just fell in love with it. The people, uh, the area. 
I'm still adjusting to the weather. That having two or three rainstorms a year was okay. I like that. I grew up in New Jersey yeah. with snowstorms, you know. Yeah. You had to work for a living. But um, we're here. We love it. It's uh, This is God's country out here, Tennessee, it is. Kentucky. Um, and if it gets too bad, we can always... Uh, Escape down to Texas, Texas once they succeed from the from the union. <laughs> yeah. uh, we shall hopefully things don't get that bad. Hopefully they don't. Um, Continue to pray for our country. Yes, please, <laughs> please. Uh, uh, everybody wants to come. Everybody wants to talk politics and all. We try to avoid politics we here. We do try to avoid politics, um, but history. History repeats itself. It really does repeat itself. And, you know, everybody bitching now about uh, all the things going on in the world and all the socialists. And er I tell my son the other day that when I came home from Desert Storm, all the Vietnam vets, you guys were all lined up to give us a hero's welcome. Even though I didn't do, like I said, I did nothing. Yeah, in Desert you Storm. went where they sent you. Yes. You served our country. Exactly. Indeed. And But that's not the welcome that you got when you guys came home from yeah, Vietnam. Yeah, it was a little different. Yeah. And, and I apologize for the previous generations treating you like that. But I reminded my son that we didn't call them socialists back then. And yeah, everybody today bitching about the college kids and everything getting indoctrinated. But back then, we didn't call them socialists. We called them communists. We didn't call them liberals. We called them hippies. But um, <laughs> it's it's the same, guys. The this country is still the greatest country on the planet, and the end is not anywhere in, in sight. It's really not. Um, no, and what people forget is that ever since 1917. When the communists took over Russia, yeah, um, there have been efforts to to attack America overtly, clandestinely, and they've now infiltrated the education system. And instead of teaching history, they're teaching other things that do not accurately reflect mm -hmm. our history, which makes America so unique. Yeah, for what you and I went to war for and were willing to die for, and uh, that's the bottom line. And we just uh, Hopefully, as things now, particularly this political arena today, just let everybody watch to see what happens, and hopefully, the, uh, America, enough people in America will wise up. I hope we can turn it around. The pendulum really will swing. Do. We yeah. had the pendulum with Jimmy, yeah. the peanut farmer, mm -hmm. and everybody saw how bad it was. We came back with a real president who cared about America, yep. loved America. Bush tried. Then we had Hillary's husband, yep. and you know, here we are today. The pendulum does continue. Oh, to it swing. does. It, it swings. Really does. Sometimes it's deeper and a little bit more bloody. <laughs> All right. Um, what is new? What is next for John? Uh, and everybody wants to hear your old war stories and everything. Uh, guys, if you have not read, what's your third book? The third, third book is Saw Chronicles. Saw Chronicles. Chronicles. That yeah, was actually which, the first one, though, right? No, no. Or Cross the Fence in Your Left Hand was the very first. Then this one. On the Ground. On the I co-authored that with John Peters. Yep. We were both recon men at FOB1 together. When did Saw Chronicles come out? <clears throat> Saw Chronicles came out two weeks or three weeks before Green Beret medic Gary Mike Rose received the Medal of Honor at the White House from President Trump on uh, October the 23rd, 2017 for bravery and heroism and uh, being the only medic on a mission from September 11th to the 14th in 1970 deep in Laos, where he kept uh, over 50% of the men who were wounded, all brought them all back. No joke. As a, and he was wounded the first night. They got hit, their uh, command post got hit with an RPG, and they went in with 16 Green Berets from a hatchet force, had 120 in Dig, and um, they were beyond the regular area of operations because the CIA had an operation further west and south near the Cambodian border that was under siege. The communists were moving uh, to take over Cambodia after Premier Sinuk had left. And there was a vacuum, a yep. political vacuum. The communists were pushing to get there. The CIA was holding them back. They said, help us. So SOG sent in a hatchet force, which is 16 men, led by then-Captain Gene McCarley 
And um, they went in and they had to take Marine Corps CH-53 Deltas because a regular helicopter couldn't take that many men. Yeah. And the third helicopter that went in, when it landed, dropping people off, they had men that got wounded. Mm -hmm. they're in three, two or three of their indigenous troops were wounded. So when the guys are exiting the helicopters, they're walking over their wounded to get in, onto the ground. Mm. So anyway, that was the mission where Mike Rose was the only medic. The first night, the command post got hit. An RPG came past them, missed all the people, hit a tree, and then exploded, and the shrapnel came backwards. And it uh, hit Mike Rose, the medic, cut off his boot, bloody, bloody his foot severely, gave him a damage in his hand. He, to this day, he still can't move some of his fingers a certain way because of injuries inflicted from that shrapnel. And then he used his CAR-15 as a crutch. And there are two other people, uh, indigenous people, that were seriously wounded. And they had to put together stretchers impromptu. And they carried these guys for three days and three nights because they were going in, they were hit, hitting anything they came into contact with. They hit it hard. They had air cover, tack air. At night, they had specters. And uh, Gene's theory of leadership was we keep moving. That way, he can't focus on us yes. with mortars and everything they else. They can't pin you down, yeah. Right. And so um, it was a brilliant strategy. He was fearless on the ground. Um, and they'd been on the ground maybe an hour and a half, two hours. They walked right into a command center, a command bunker. Here's all this <laughs> intel. They're picking up maps, and there's hardly anybody there. They, they beat off anybody that was there from the indigenous troops that were stayed behind because they'd never seen anybody that deep mm -hmm. in the layoffs. It was beyond our area of operations. Yep. So while they're there packing intel and stuff, the telephone rang. <laughs> yeah, that's one of my the, favorite the enemy all time. telephone in the yeah. command post. They're in the North Vietnamese Army command post, deep in Laos. The phone rings, and one of the smart ass Green Berets picks up, Hello, Fifth Special Forces Group, may I help you? <laughs> 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 to this day, Ho Chi Minh is trying to figure out how the hell that happened. But that operation was amazing, and they moved day and night. They had more casualties. Um, of the 16 Green Berets that went in, they awarded 32 Purple Hearts after that mission was over. And many Valor Awards, which I've lost count of. Yeah. And then Mike, it took a little while for him, but he got his Medal of Honor in 2017. Just a humble guy. After all that. <clears throat> oh, yeah. He didn't get his Medal of Honor in 69, didn't get it in 70, Yeah. didn't get it in 75. <clears throat> nope. He got it. Uh, he got it during Trump's presidency. He did. Well, oh, <clears throat> A, See, yes. that just blows me away. How? How, how does that... I, now, and I've, I've read uh, I've read a couple other books written by other fine gentlemen about um, uh, the exploits of the MacV Saw guys and everything. And one of, I guess, the pack clerks or somebody actually admitted to being jealous and he actually lost, deliberately lost some paperwork for Medal of Honor. I can't fathom. Oh, no, well, a, right now, there's yeah. literally a case of an officer, Paris Davis, who was uh, an African American officer with SF, and he saved Billy Wall's life in a major firefight, a major battle. He's put in for the Medal of Honor. It was lost. He was put in for it a second time. It was lost yet again. And so now, for the third time or fourth time, there's a renewed effort to get him his Medal of Honor. He's still alive. And uh, they've uh, have had some brain attorney. One of the lead attorneys is Jim Moriarty, who was in the Marine Corps, a door gunner with the Marines that supported SOG across no the fence. Yeah. And uh, he's just, he's supported the Green Brand. And then for Operation Tailwind, Jim was pro bono because um, after... Let's see, it was 28 years after Operation Tailwind went down. Yeah. The Communist News Network, also known as CNN, <laughs> uh, did a story, and Time Warner did a story based on that mission. They turned it around and fabricated an entire story to say that the Green Berets there had gone in to hunt down American deserters of dissidents who were in Laos running away from the war. Oh, and while they were there, the Green Berets used 
um, there's a gas, a poisonous gas that they use on the enemy and on the Americans that ran away. Oh, and by the way, the, you, and you know the way Green Berets are. While they were there, they killed women and children. Oh, yeah, of course. That's a given. That's, that's, a, given. So that's a given with the Communist no News joke. Network. So ah. Jim Moriarty, again, this is just a tough little kick-ass attorney, went to the defense of those Green Berets. And uh, he got them justice, but it took a while. All the settlements were off the record. They were sealed. Ted Turner and the boys coughed up some money. I hope it was a lot of money. We'll never know how much. But that gets us back to Mike Rose. And he got he finally got his Medal of Honor. And today, Jim Moriarty's been one of the key people fighting on behalf of uh, Paris Davis. That's an awesome. outstanding awesome. troop. I, I just can't fathom. It's okay to have conflicting political views and everything, but some of this just blatant lying. And I understand they see themselves as victims. Yeah. The other side. So it's okay. It's okay to lie, cheat, and steal when you're a victim. That's how they justify this stuff. But uh, <laughs> that's just not how my mother raised me. That I couldn't no. do some of the shit that these these people are doing. Well, plus, your mom caught you. She kicked your ass like yeah. my mom. My yeah, little exactly. my Dutch farm girl would like oh. beat. You know, yeah. Mm. Forget about it. Do not lie, cheat, or steal. Whew. Crazy Amen. stuff. Crazy, crazy, crazy stuff. But that's part of all that. You know, yeah. this whole, and nobody in SF goes, joins SF to be, to go get medals. We're For in sure. special forces to For serve sure. the country. Yeah. And what people, a lot of people forget is, and you know it better, we're there essentially to go out to help people. De oppresso liber is the model of the Green Bridge. Yeah. To free the oppressed. Yep. And we go out and train people, countries, how to defend themselves, take care of themselves, to better their lives. And... To be free of tyranny. Which makes it hard to sit on this side of the fence right now watching what our own politicians are doing. It, it's not the country. The country's awesome. Indeed. It's not the military. The military's awesome. <laughs> it's, uh, it's the politicians. And when I say politicians, it's, um, there are politicians in the media. There are politicians in the military. A lot of our senior leaders, once you reach a certain level, I know you've seen it. Oh, yeah. Once they reach a certain level, they all of a sudden start playing ball with the people above them because they, uh, they want to make that next promotion. And I, I tell people, it's really, is it that bad to retire as a one-star general? You know, instead of making that second star, is it, you're still making three times what a E7 makes. If you're enlisted, is it really that bad to retire as a E8 instead of making E9? Yeah. Um, and then sergeant majors, don't even get me started on them. <laughs> I'm like, you, you understand there's no E10. You're, what are you, why are you trying to get promoted? You know, uh, sometimes you got to take care of, you got to take care of the troops. And we've talked about this. Well, that's why they have a sergeant uh, yeah. major mafia sometimes. Mm. It's off the record. But it gets things done. And then networking, they can help their troops that way behind the scenes without having to go through all the yes. protocols. And, and that's how it's supposed to work all the time. But uh, uh. unfortunately, especially a peacetime army, there's just so many leaders that forget uh, their job is accomplish the mission, care and welfare of the troops, and nothing else matters. Nothing, nothing else matters. But um, yeah, dude, you're I. I grew up on you. You're you're one of the you're one of the legends. I look up to you, dude. I look up to you. Yeah, when we um, heard about the men that follow our footsteps, who we look up to, and say thank you for moving forward and improving what we did. He was uh, so the Mac V Saw guys. They're my idols growing up. Love reading about any of that, uh, anything that they put out. I didn't realize you were doing uh, Soldier of Fortune even. How, uh, who was your uh, heroes, icons that you, that you grew up on? Who did you want to see in the news, uh, in the movies? On, uh, <laughs> who was that? Who caught your eye? Well, you know, we used to, when we, we were kids in the 50s, <clears throat> yeah. 
in the, in the early 60s, you, every Saturday, if it rained or snowed, you had movies that were World War II movies. There were so many movies produced, some really high quality. Yeah. And uh, the old Audie so, Murphy ones. Audie Murphy. He played, his, played himself in his own movies. That's Indeed. kind of badass. Uh, you can know? you imagine? <laughs> I mean, oh my God. So, but, you know, Audie Murphy and of course, um, who's the guy from World War I? I keep forgetting, the Tennessee. <clears throat> uh, York, Sergeant York. Sergeant York. Yeah. Yes. I mean, those are the men that you hear about. Uh, and like that's from the combat side, and then I had uncles that my uncle was a, a pilot in World War II. He flew over to Burma Hump, uh, and um, and then another uncle fought in World War One. He's stone deaf because he was a cannon cocker in artillery. He just yeah. blew his hearing out. Yeah, and, over uh, and over and over again. Absolutely. Yeah. And then we, of course, we had uh, family members that were like uncles who were. Just straight carpenters, good Americans, hardworking, mm -hmm. honest as the day as long. It was just like you grew up with that mix, you know. Yeah, well, had cool. the, had the final impact. And then, you know, when Vietnam came along, we didn't even know where the hell it was until we read about Roger Dolan being the first Medal of Honor recipient in the Vietnam War. Of course, he was the first Green Beret to get the Medal of Honor in the war. And then we began to read the papers a little bit. And then uh, took me two years to flunk out of college. And then it's like, you're going to get drafted. And that book, or, yep. The Green Berets the Green by Robert Moore. I mean, there are literally hundreds of men that joined Special Forces thanks Just to Robert Just because Moore. of that book. Yeah. All right. So uh, those of you who are not familiar with, the, everybody, <laughs> everybody knows about the movie uh, The Green Berets with John Wayne. Right. And don't forget now, you saw it when you were a kid. What, what grade? Uh, junior high school. Now, not in the movie theater. I'm not that old. No, no. Uh, but it was Saturday <laughs> afternoon TV matinee. Uh, the, the big wooden TV set that right. was like four foot wide, Indeed. four foot tall, three foot deep. The and, big you're, TV. and you were fighting your sister to give you time. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. For sure. Now, for when sure. I saw the Green Berets, we were in country in the train. In Vietnam. In Vietnam. Just got done our in-country training. And there's the Duke. We finally saw the movie, The Green Berets. You know, it's like but you had already read out. the book and decided that. Oh See, yeah, I didn't realize that the book, The Green Berets, written by Robin Moore. Yes, actually, that's what prompted you to join the military. It did, and I said, if I'm going to Vietnam, I want to go with these guys if I qualify. Dude, that's that was crazy because here we are. Yeah, twelve generations later. At least twelve. And. <laughs> <laughs> And literally, I saw that movie a Saturday afternoon in yeah. junior high. Went, that's what I, that's what I'm. I didn't say that's what I wanted. There's, that's what I'm going to do with my life. I'm going to be a green boy. Yeah, and I knew I was going to go. Small world, dude. Absolutely, small I knew, world. I knew I was going. So I said, <laughs> if I can go with these guys, and remember the really cool thing about that book, the one thing that I, I mean, there's a lot of really relevant things, but in it there was a guy, a green beret who told his A-team, if I ever get killed, I want you to name a latrine after me. Yeah. I Pedator used that latrine. Yeah. When you I went, used that latrine. Yeah, because he did get killed, and there was his name. We got so. All right. Um, that's all that, conventional spirit. <laughs> that story right there, uh, I got a little vignette for you. Oh, no. Uh, the initial invasion of Afghanistan. We're in Kandahar. I have my whole SIF company there. And we got a backhoe, dug us a slit trench. Right. And um, my engineers built us the sexiest. It was like a six-seater. A six-seater? Six-seater. Wow. Three on either side, right? We See, didn't have the modern barrels like you guys That's have. the modern oh, army. Yeah, modern man. stuff. Modern you had stuff. the good stuff. Um, <laughs> we took an orange and white parachute from the ejection seat of a MiG. <laughs> That uh, from a MiG? A, from a MiG. That an AC-130 had, had blown up like a couple days before we got there. Really? Seriously, a heart attack. So we built this thing with uh, the parachute. Um, the very next day, literally, we had just built to put the parachute over it. The very next, well, it was actually that night, I think, um, was when the, the Air Force, U.S. Air Force, bombed the shit out of the American uh, Green Berets over Ooh. there. And one of the guys that was killed was a guy named Pedatory. Right. Uh, Pedatory was a great guy from our group. Uh, Is that right? So I come out there the next day. From fifth group. Mean. From fifth group. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Come out there and there's a wooden sign that said Pedatory's privy. 
And <laughs> I was like... That's right, because we had yeah, privy, it privy in the it, book. That's what it was, a privy. Oh, my God. I don't remember the guy's name... I can't either. ...in the, in the book. Um, but they called the latrine a privy. Yes, indeed. Because every, every building he went by, he said, he just doesn't sing. Yeah. Uh, and we remember that part from the movie. And I, I remember, <laughs> and I wish I could say it was my idea. It was not. Yeah. But I remember coming out to their little spank palace out there with the, the orange and white parachute over top of it. And there's a sign. Because we had just heard, we're like, dude, man, all these guys got killed. Predatory oh. was an awesome guy. And there's a sign, Predatory's Privy. I'll dig, I'll dig that picture up for you. Yeah, please. Uh, that's <laughs> funny. That's funny SF shit. history. That is SF history. That's some funny shit right there. You've actually used the one in Vietnam. Oh, yeah, I did. Because I, I looked it up. Mm. Me and McIntyre, we hunted it down. Because John had read the book also. And we made it a point. We were there, and we wanted to be able to tell our parents, you know, hey, we read the book. This is what this guy wanted. And that's the way the SF guy yeah. is. If that man gets killed in an accident, if, he, if that's what he wants, he'll get it. Yeah. And he wanted his privy, he got it. All right. Um, <laughs> because some of our viewers are fans of feces and stuff. Oh, uh, no shit. My captain on my A team. Indeed. Nathaniel Starbuck Smith. His Starbuck? Starbuck was his middle name. Uh, his Oh, nothing to do with... Uh, no, his uh, okay. parents were <laughs> fans of the TV show Battlestar Galactica, I think. I don't know. Um, don't ask. <laughs> Nathaniel Starbuck Smith. And he was a great captain. Great captain. Uh, like all officers, terrible at land nav. That's another story. Um well, that's a prerequisite he, of being an officer, Exactly. Right? Yeah, of course. You can't find your ass, can't find your direction. So yeah. He, I'm sorry, I'm only kidding. I'm only he's kidding. <laughs> uh, in the meeting uh, there in Kandahar, and we're in a bombed-out Russian building, and all of a sudden he gets up and hauls ass, hauls ass, runs to the shitter. We're thinking he's got the shits. He comes back with a thousand-yard stare, and he's like, my pistol fell into the hole. Oh. <laughs> 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 and we're all like, I ain't going to get it. We dug that thing deep, so yeah. so we would never ever have to worry about it. it right? Yeah. Um, our engineer, uh, Jeremy Lyle, who's now a command sergeant major, really, and down in um, down in Tampa, Florida, at the at SOCOM. SOCOM. Wow. Uh, Jeremy Lyle actually fished that Beretta out of the shitter for our captain. Uh, I hope the captain cleaned it. Not, we won't talk about that. The shit we share on tactical riflemen. Indeed, huh? I'll drink to that. <laughs> mm. All right, so and um, thank you for the coffee, by the way. No, don't thank me. Uh, oh, who I want do we you thank? to thank Erica Hotstetler. She is our one of our resident nutbags here in the asylum tonight. Indeed. Um, that's a when, prerequisite. You have to be a little bit nuts to be here. You have to be here. a little mad. Yeah, so very do. good. Um, Chad, welcome to the show. Yes. Yeah. Um, these, <laughs> when she heard we were going to have you back on the show, she she heard about how much you liked the Black Rifle coffee iced espressos last time. Mm. She's like, Carl, I got to hook you up. So um, anyway, so she sent a case of these uh, espresso mochas. And then another patron... Wow. Actually sent, this is called Patron XO Cafe. It is tequila with coffee liqueur. You've got to drive home tonight. Yes, a so, long ride, um, so I'm sticking. So I'm going to have some, you, not you. Help, thank you very much. Give me a verbal report on it, okay? Um, delicious <laughs> as always. All right, good stuff. He only, he only drinks like a bottle or two a month. Nah, not that bad. <laughs> not, not anymore, bad. anyways. I actually got a text from <coughs> Command Sergeant Major Rick Lamb. No. Uh, the I, I, one I did, of the only? Actually. <laughs> My first ODA adopted all the SOG and B-52 standard operating procedures. I wore a stable rig as LCE as my primary rig for most of my career. Great show. Wow. Um, guys, those of you Here's know who... Kidding? Rick Lamb is. He actually sent this picture. He's a real legend. He's on uh, Tip of the Spear magazine. Yeah. Um, Chad, can you hold this up so uh, Chad, so he can see his own picture? Make sure you. 
hold it up for the camera. It's autofocus. Oh, very good. Rick Lamb. Rick, I wish you were here, brother. Maybe next time. Maybe <laughs> Here's next looking time. at you, Sergeant Major. <laughs> no, I'll tell you what. Rick's coming up in July to film some videos. Really? He is. And when he does... Uh, we'll have to have you up. We'll fire up the fire pit out back. I've, I've actually got a skull in it. Not a real skull. I keep all my real skulls uh, in the house. Um, but it's a skull. Uh, the Texas A&M cadets got me. It's actually made out of the same material that the ceramic tiles on the space shuttle are made out of. Really? Which is kind of sexy, right? That's oh, yeah. Sexy. That's cool. So, yeah, we'll have a couple skulls in the fire pit. And, all right. Um, uh, yeah, well, what do you think, Chad? We'll light the fire pit. We're going to do steaks, we but, will have... but no lamb chops. <laughs> said no lamb chops. <laughs> okay. All right. Uh, but we can do that. We can do... We'll make this happen. We'll see what Sergeant that. Major has to say about that. I'm sure he'll chime in. <laughs> oh, I get it now. Rick lamb chop. Look at that. I'm trying to open my coffee thing. It's a bottle of compressed CO2 for my pistol. That's funny. <laughs> Now we're loaded. We're armed now. This is a dry fire kit, so I can. <laughs> but uh, good stuff, indeed. You got to dry fire. You got to stay you sharp. Do, you have I can to. be able to teach classes and stuff. <laughs> All right. Um, guys, if you have not read any of his books, uh, oh, one, you, you need to take out your pocket knife. You need to just crike yourself. You need to secure your own airway because basically you're one of two things. You're either a burden on society or um, you haven't been living the proper life. Because I'm here to tell you, every time I get to a sexy story inside here, um, I immediately mark it with a business card. Brother, I ran out of business cards. Um, I brought some more for you. No, 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 no. I, I have tons of business cards. I have. But my point is, literally, I can't go through this book and say, this is my favorite chapter. Right. I, I can't. It, it is literally from start to finish. Holy cow, I cannot believe that these guys did this. I really can't. So if you haven't read it yet, please, please start with this one right here. Across the Fence. This was your first book. Yes, sir. Um, and then we came out with an expanded edition. The expanded of this one. Yeah. What would you add to it? We, we added the 50 photos. Okay. Because the first book had no photographs. And so I have the expanded edition. You do. Yeah. Absolutely. Nothing but, the, nothing but the best for the Sergeant Major. You know oh, and I appreciate that. Please and then don't call we me Sergeant Major, dude. You know how much I hate Sergeant Major. We're right Majors. up there with Rick. I mean, I if hate we're, Sergeant Major. We give him a yeah, of glory. Rick here. was a good Sergeant Major. He was. He I was not good. a good Sergeant Major. But Rick was a good Sergeant Major. But those are few and far between. Um, um, whew. There's but, another one. His name was Perry Bear. He was actually <clears throat> Command Sergeant Major of 5th Special Forces Group. He went on the use of SOC. And, uh, uh, but anyways, he passed away uh, a little while ago, and he will be missed. Another, another great American. Um, what else did you add besides the pictures? Uh, and three more stories. Three more <clears throat> stories. Dude. One of which was the Frenchman, my buddy the Frenchman. As one of the few Green Berets I know who's got shot in the back four times <laughs> with an AK-47 and lived to talk about it. Uh, chapter this eight. This is literally um, <laughs> one of the stories right there, literally. Yeah. The Frenchman. The Frenchman. It's, uh, guys, I'm telling you, funny story. He, he added it. It's literally got one of my business cards there. Oh, yeah. Uh, no, gr great story. Great story. There's some of the phenomenal stuff that you guys would do. Um, You're getting texts. Is Rick texting you back? Yeah. Uh -oh. who's, who's not texting me? Rick I get who? texts from people telling me, hey, Carl, I'm not going to be able to make the live stream tonight. <laughs> what? Really? You Really? All right, but no, that's not the... All right, um, he has said, you guys are awesome at the risk of sounding gay. I miss you guys. <laughs> That's fair. Yeah, nice. you, you understand, Rick. That's propensity right there, brother. Um, yeah, uh, that's okay. It's, it's, it's okay to be gay. We love you, dude. We do. Um, and he says he will bring his BAR when he comes up in July. Oh, really? We are going to... You want to put him on the phone? Uh, do we want to... You want Rick to call him? Why not? If he, I mean, if he's not too busy, we understand. Rick, if you're not too busy... Yeah. Um, Slide those in, in your ears. Why don't you give me a call, Rick? 
<laughs> Guys, uh, we are going to have oh, wait. Those ones are Command mine. Sergeant Major These ones are yours. retired Rick Lamb call in. And, uh, if he's not too busy. If he's not too busy. Uh, he's not too busy. Rick, you drop what you're doing because I'm about to ruin. The image no. and the style that you're used <laughs> to. No. This guy wants to talk to you. Uh, now i got to put my headphones on. Oh, yeah. Here we go. We're getting color coordinated. Here, plug that in your phone. Kind of has know if to Rick be plugged call, in. Guys. Come I'm, on, Rick. He might blow us off. Come on, Rick. He might blow us off. He might. Don't be a Sally, Sergeant Major. <laughs> you guys see what I got to work with? All right. Um, I think this one right here goes in this ear. Chad, uh, we should have done this ahead see, of John. time. That one goes in your right. Or, I'm sorry, left. Uh, my right. the left? Yeah. <laughs> there you I, go. I don't know if he's going to call my good or ear. not. Up around the back. Oh, okay. Uh, this was supposed to be a podcast. He could be, so he could we'll, be busy we'll right see now. How it, we'll see how it plays out. Or not. But um, we shall see. We shall see. All right, I have Command we, Major Rick Lamb calling in. <clears throat> Rick, you there? Oh my God! Carl, what's up, my brother? How you oh, doing? Oh, dude, it is so good to hear your voice, man. It's so, I wish you were sitting here with us. I would, oh, I, I would too, vacate man. my chair. I would give my chair up for Rick, without a doubt. Um, Can you hear him? Rick, very good. Uh, John Stryker Myers, the legend. Fucking war daddy, man. John <laughs> Rick Lamb. Uh, One of my daddy. heroes. No, dude, uh, sincerely. Absolutely. Uh, Rick, I, do I not have the coolest job on the planet, dude? Literally, <laughs> I went from being a, a lowly guy in the army to now I literally get to sit here on the World Wide Web with, uh, with two of my biggest heroes. I mean, if I could bring Randy Wurst in here, we go. I, I think I'd be all set. I'd have all three of you, literally. It's just awesome. It is awesome. Um, we'll be sure to meet you when you come out in July. I, oh, it's gonna, that is going to be awesome. No, I, I think yeah, I, I was I was glad to hear that you moved up there and, and like like uh, like you said you got out of that communist nation you were in. <laughs> indeed indeed. <laughs> Rick, uh, sincerely, uh, yeah, don't you be reneging on me, brother. You need to come up oh, in no, July. No. Okay. <laughs> if I got a low crawl, I'll be there. <laughs> we were supposed to film uh, back in what was it? Uh, early April, end of March, uh, me, Chad, my son, we went down to go parachute at the Round Canopy Parachute Team. And while we were down there, we were supposed to be filming videos. Rick has got all the old World War II weapons, the Thompson, um, the Grand, right. everything. Amazing collection, I heard about it. Yeah, uh, all uniforms and everything. And we were going to do videos showing the different shooting tactics. and uh, Because we do... The critical task evaluations, you know, shooting, transitioning to your pistol if your rifle jams. Yeah. They couldn't do that back then. You know, if your rifle jammed, you basically pulled off your helmet and threw it at the guy. Or in our but, case, we had our M79 sawed yeah, off. Yeah, spin an M79 <laughs> and shoot a guy in the chest with a 40 millimeter HE round. Uh, or flechettes. Or flechettes. Um, <laughs> and, 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 you know, we, we, we always respected the saw guys because everything... We did. I, yeah, I remember we, we thought we were smart, right? We sewed, uh, we took the pockets off the, uh, yeah. the the lower and sewed them on our <laughs> sleeves. And then the saw guy says, hey, man, uh, we, we, we did that, man, in the 60s. He said, but don't feel bad. We got it from the paratroopers in the 40s. Yeah. So, the, uh, <laughs> well, I wonder where we every, got that from. Every, every time you no shoot one of those old anymore. guns, yeah. <laughs> wearing that old kit, I mean, you just have nothing but respect. Well, don't for, forget, uh, that's, a, that's a mutual reciprocity here, sir. I mean, uh, the old gray has like us respected you and this character sitting alongside of me here because uh, no, it's dude, the next generation. I, I, I didn't do ah, a freaking now. thing, but yeah, I'll tell respect you what, I was your surrounded elders. by respect some awesome elders, guys. Man. Come on now. Respect your elders. <laughs> <laughs> but we yes, old sir. gray heads respect all you guys because you carried on a tradition, took it mm. to the next level. You really did. That's awesome. That is. Man, we yeah. are going to have such a good time. Rick. I tell you what I'm going to yes, do, sir. brother. I am going to give you the honor of the first question from the peanut gallery. If you could ask John Stryker Myers, aka Tilt, anything, anything at all, and you better not ask favorite color. I swear, boy. I swear. Anything you want. What you got? 
I, the static line jumps. Yes. I heard you guys made about 10 of them. There were 12 the, static uh, line and five halo. But that yes. all happened after I went home for the last time. In fact, now, off, we, the, off the record, I wouldn't say this for the record or anything, but when the idea first popped up in 1970, myself and Lynn Black said, uh, that sounds kind of crazy. <laughs> Doing a halo into layoffs, <laughs> the, so we I'm, ran the other way. Let's keep, we'll that, just we'll do the conventional, good to get on the ground. But yes, uh, the first team that went in, Cliff Newman, Mel Hill was the one zero, and we just buried Mel sadly at the uh, Arlington Cub last month. Yeah, and Ooh. then Cliff Newman. Wow, and so, Sammy, Sammy Hernandez, a third member of the team, but that was the first SOG halo mission. So if. The MacV Sog guy says you're crazy, brother. You're crazy. Oh, yeah. <laughs> yeah. You're out there. <laughs> well, because again, you know, what, what I it's my understanding that uh, you know the Halo the Halo missions again they're they're tough. They're they're even tougher to do at night. You know, you assemble in the air, assemble on the ground. But uh, but I heard as the ADA threat grew, then uh, then they were they had to go nap of the earth, and uh, so they were they're down uh, nap of the earth, right? You know, hugging the trees, and then they would just pop up. And uh, Bob sled everybody out the ass end of the uh, the bird on a static line, and everybody was assembled and down, no reserves. And because uh, you know we 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 struggle with that all the time still. Yeah, you know, yeah. Is is, uh, is that a good technique still? And I I've always said yes. And, yeah, I, uh, I I would I would uh, fall on your side of the argument on that, particularly if you're jumping in the triple canopy or a regular forest. And don't forget, here's the other kicker to that. Um, all the Americans carried homing devices so that the theory being once you got on the ground, assuming they would be separated, yeah. turn your homing device on and they would be able to home in on your fellow team member. Mm -hmm. Had its own frequency. They forgot one little thing. Everybody else. The, no. They could be hard. They, they be... jumped in the rain. Oh. And those homing devices were not waterproof. Oh. So they. Oh. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> and Cliff Newman has. Exquisite detail, and Sammy Hernandez, I'm sure, because oh, Sammy is like, they, they, those guys are fearless. And you know, Amazing. a little thing, a little hiccup like that, which could have literally been fixed by just wrapping the radio in saran wrap. Yeah, yeah. Or, or a Ziploc bag. Like, we, yeah. we take Ziploc bags and duct tape the sides of it and would reuse Ziploc bags for years with maps in them. But see, oh, that's, oh, yeah. that shows how you and Rick improved on what we did no but we make this we make the exact same mistakes uh yeah well, that's now, true. like like uh, wrapping wrapping the handset in a uh, in a battery bag yeah uh operation the, valkyrie oh, yeah. i just remember i told you about operation valkyrie yes. we do once a year um i carry one of those uh battery packs for recharging cell phones cameras because you know, yeah, yeah a lot of pictures and stuff but it's the same one that i use for uh jumping vehicles uh, I can literally jump start a 6.4 right. Hemi with this thing. And um, I can recharge a cell phone like 30 times. It's awesome to have. Uh, my whole kayak was underwater, <laughs> literally underwater. My whole kayak and my battery pack was dead. Where all I had, that, my nods were fine. My helmet was fine. My M4, all the magazines filled with Sims ammo were fine. But, but my battery pack that I was using to recharge my phone because I was filming yeah, the yeah. clients. L little, little mistakes. I'm like, I'm not even in the military anymore, and I'm making the same stupid mistakes. Uh, yeah, to hear you guys making that same thing back then, just crazy. Oh, yeah. Crazy stuff. And things you never think about. You know, yeah. like, well, here's a homing device. Is it waterproof? In the event that we, and they did. I mean, they jumped Halo in the rain at night into layoffs, the first jump. Amazing. I know. You know they would be so spread out, like. Oh yeah. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Did they ever get? Did they ever link up on the ground? Any of them? You know what? I really forget. I I think the answer is no. <laughs> so then you're doing single man ops trying yeah. to get back the. the and they had and they had some adige that didn't yeah. reconnect it, and so I I forget the exact numbers. Uh, you know, and uh, and Cliff and uh, Sammy Hernandez are just part of our SOG legends. They're just amazing guys. Now, Rick, you <clears> mentioned uh, that you wore the stable harness forever. Um, I got to war, like I said, mo I, as soon as I joined the military, I went straight to a recon platoon and I was taught never go down the ladder. So I was never really in a line company my whole time I was in a 
recon platoon. So I lived out of my LBE. If I had to dump my ruck, my load bearing uh, vest, uh, my load bearing equipment, my, right. my little butt pack, that was a butt ruck. It had my <laughs> folding saw, everything. But the stable harnesses, um, we use from time to time, not that much, but I, Rick, you literally wore that thing on a regular basis. Yeah, I, I had that with me all the time. In fact, we uh, it, it saved me from walking a bunch because the uh, <laughs> we, we'd uh, we'd either rig the uh, the fries or the uh, or, or the spies. Yeah. On anytime we had aircraft, so we'd uh, we'd go over there and we'd rig it, and then of course the pilots they all they all want to train it and fly it. Yeah. So uh, when we were on the sniper detachment and they'd throw us out early a couple of days, you know, you'd find the target and you're sitting there, and then mm. the, the assault force comes in and they they land right on the objective because we handrailed them right in. And uh, they know where to go, where their breach point is, bam. And then they get on the helicopters, fly out, and then they said, all right, it's not, you're walking out. And so Ooh. we'd say, no, we're, we're going to train some fries. <laughs> we, <laughs> we had, we, we'd call them emergency exfil. We're, uh, we're in contact, and uh, they would come and fly us out. Right, yeah, no. that, uh, that, that, was, that was one of the best rigs. In fact, the uh, Sergeant Major Jefferson, I don't know if you remember him from, uh, from uh, 7th Group, hard as woodpecker lips i mean the guy was a mixed martial artist before it was you know popular mm -hmm. and uh, so his, his thing when he would have a problem on the team he'd say let's settle it in the ring so he'd, he'd get him in the ring <laughs> and he'd, he'd get total compliance so he uh, he he works his way up to be the uh the, the star major of third group and uh I, I took all of our sops up there and uh because we were wearing you know back in that day we were wearing brown boots but, you know, we're wearing black boots, right? But yeah. uh, but I I had the guys wearing brown boots with the roughs out because you know black's not a color commonly found in yeah, nature. Exactly. Yeah. We're using uh, you know, we're spray painting our uh, our our ODs. We uh, we sewed pockets on the sleeves. We were wearing cravat cravats for belts or uh, or the uh, the tourniquets for belts. I mean, it was it was the SOG SOPs. You know, you had yeah. your your, your, your pace cord place for everything. Everything yeah. in its place. And I took that stuff up, and we we wore ghillie hats. As, uh, you know, that was our standard headgear in the in the woods. So uh, we we took uh, I took all the SOPs up, and Jefferson looked through them. He said, uh, you know, "We had remember when you get an ash tune for having a, a camelback. We took the camelbacks and we uh, we <laughs> took a you know cut off a a leg off of a set of fatigues, and then we yeah. we we slid it into there. And uh, so we took all this stuff up. We were wearing stable rigs, and uh, and Jefferson looked at it, you know every page and he blessed off on it and he said that is your sop it's written down that's what you guys do and uh so we would uh we'd get the guys i'd get them up in the morning for pt and uh, we had a packing list you know everything had to be in its place and we'd uh we'd go out and we'd set up a, a little orp we do the priorities of work and uh because you, know, you, you gotta know how you're putting the stuff in the rucksack and the yeah. guys whined a little bit at first <laughs> But once they once they got at it to where you know you're pulling security, then you're doing your weapons maintenance, your personal hygiene, your chow, and then you come in and we do our training out there in the patrol base. We do sticks and rags, we do comms, you know, just do the, the basic cross training. Mm -hmm. But we'd also got to the point to where when everybody's out doing PT and they're running and they're rucking out there on the uh, you know on the sand trails, mm -hmm. we would uh, we'd move across there as a, as a unit. And uh, we'd put out the flank security. We'd send out the guys to secure the far side. And this is while dudes are running yeah, and rucking so up and down the trail. You somebody to respond and, to. Yeah. And if it would take us hours to get across a road, <laughs> the, uh, we, we, we'd do it. I mean, if, if it took us the entire day, that's what we did. And then we'd go up to that obstacle course oh. up there on, the, on Gruber, and uh, we'd run it tactically. So we'd, we'd usually have like a Bangalore torpedo box or a 40-pound shape charge box, you know, full of sand. <laughs> And then we'd have sling rope, snap links, gloves. But we'd secure the near side, yeah. and we'd send two guys across, secure the far side, and then the, the rest of the team would would move that that piece of equipment through that obstacle course. And there was about 15, 15 or seventeen obstacles where you're dragging that the kid out. Nice. Oh. And it got to the point where we uh, we said, okay, we're we're not talking. There, there's absolutely it's all hand and arm signals. So from the time we left the team room until the time we got back to the team room. It was all hand and arm signals. So you could you could do a hand and arm signal to get into a perimeter, and you could write it out longhand on a fucking notebook. You could uh, <laughs> you, you could scratch it out in the dirt and uh, for a little sand table. But you had, you had it by hand and arm signals by freaking you know looking the, the dude in the eyes, 
or you had to communicate, you know, what you needed to get done. That's crazy. And, Good and stuff. all <laughs> that shit was, was SOG stuff. A lot of it. And, uh, uh, and indeed. So first time uh, uh, you actually had to use a stable rig well, in combat, in combat. I never used one. Never used one. They came out, but I, I stuck with the old Swiss seat. All right, um, that's what I meant, though. Like, I was going to say, because in the book, you, you got basically stabled out a few times. Oh, yeah, we got pulled yeah. out quite a bit on ropes. I, first time uh, <laughs> in combat, we can't get to the helicopter. You're going to have to drop ropes. 150-foot rope with a D-ring on it. Yeah. And, and that's an early <laughs> phase before... <laughs> Before, Tell us about hey, it. Hey, hey, John, was that, was that a single line or were you guys double line? Oh, no, single line, just with a uh, D-ring and a sandbag <laughs> on the end to help get the, get, it, get it through the jungle to the floor. <laughs> one D-ring for how many it guys? Swiss guys? Oh, no, one, one rope for each guy. For Sometimes. Each guy. So if you had a four-man team. Yeah, or a six-man. Or six-man. Sometimes we require two helicopters. Now, it, it, it depended on the high, you know, the whole thing with elevation. One of your you put like six guys on four ropes or something like that. Right. Yeah, yeah, we did that because it was at the end of the day and they were closing in and we were getting low on ammo and they hit us so hard. And we that's when I think that was one where when we left, we put up a claymore with a Willie Pete on it. Yeah. And as we're going out, I, I held it <laughs> until we got the full length and clacked it off. So, and lit up and lit up the NVA, literally. All right, now we're, you gotta elaborate on this because I, I read the I read the story. <laughs> and <laughs> give our viewers the give our viewers the situation. So you're you're being chased by uh well a large what amount country of NBA. you in? Oh, we're in Laos. 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 So we're not in... even in the correct country. Okay. No, no. Of course, you know. Remember, President Nixon in September of '69 went on television that we have no combat troops stationed in Laos. None. That's true. Technically, didn't lie. No, we didn't lie. We flew in by helicopter. Now this was um, <laughs> this was Idaho. This was your team. RT Idaho. Yes. What was uh, Recon Team Idaho made? Up? What was the makeup at this mission? How uh, many guys did you mission, have with you? We had. Uh, I think we had six. Six Myself. Americans. No. No, no. We always ran two or three Americans with SF. Uh, yeah. And then our, we had extraordinary Indigenous troops. Yeah. And uh, th three or four of our guys came from North Vietnam with their families in 54. And they knew that their government in South Vietnam was corrupt. They preferred that to being under the communist thumb. They preferred and corruption they willing, over communism. They would, they preferred, and they were ready to die for it. So okay. on that mission, we had six. We got inserted, we had moved for a while, and then they came <coughs> at us. <clears throat> and the weather was closing in, and we literally found a hole in the jungle where they could get the 150 foot ropes down to us. And uh, we had extreme contact. The Covey led us through um, to Covey the north. Covey is Covey the, is the, the uh, Ford Air Controller. Yeah, the FAC. Okay. Yeah, and so he told us we had to go to the north to get to this hole in the jungle. Well, we just had contact there, so we went back, hit the area again with M79 fire, went through it. Sal, who was our Vietnamese counterpart, team yeah. leader, and he was he was a sharp tack. Oh. You, you you talk all about Sal in the book. Sal's amazing. Yeah. He was. He was. Uh, but when I landed there in '68, he had been fighting with SOG for over two years, two and a half years, maybe three. And so this mission was in uh, early '69, and we had gone in. They came at us, and we had an ongoing firefight. Never really set up a perimeter. We kept moving, and then the weather closed in, and Covey said, "This is your last chance." They came in. They threw down four ropes. And um, we were able to get guys, out. six guys, so you should have been guys. able to do it. Yeah, we shouldn't have. But again, the good thing was, it wasn't too high at elevation. It was raining, so the air was heavier, and, it, yeah. and the, the helicopter could get more lift. Yeah. All right. Um, you're in dire straits, taking effective fire the whole time. Oh, yeah. Now, they're not light, they're not, they can't shoot up the helicopter because it's literally a small hole in a triple canopy jungle. Elaborate on this Claymore thing because I don't think our, our viewers they haven't read the story, brother. And this is insane. Just just being in this situation is crazy. Dire. We have to do this. But 
What kind of knucklehead comes up with this idea? Well, <laughs> yeah, the, I think the title of that book was a not too bright idea. <laughs> but uh, my one one who was uh, a weapons guy, and he had been cross trained in all the explosives. So John Shore, I told him, I said, "Look, put that thing up as high as we can get it. I'll hold the clacker when we go out because the way they're coming at us, we're going to need to buy time as the helicopters lift us out." So he, he puts us as high as he can up in a tree. Right. And it's a Claymore mine. Yeah, and then we tied a Willie P to it. Tied a Willie P to it. Now, the clacker, for those of you that, you got, you got to understand, most of our viewers have just seen nothing but Arnold Schwarzenegger movies, oh. <laughs> and the clacker's got a little green light on it with an antenna. That is so not the case. You've got, what is it, 50 feet, 100 feet of I wire? I think it was 50 feet. 50 I, feet of wire. Yeah. And so we, it's tied into the Claymore. As we're getting pulled up, I'm watching the rope, firing with the car 15 on one hand, but watching the rope, I mean the wire that led to the Claymore. Yeah. So we got the max distance away from And we had, Bubba had it pointed, so the Claymore was facing down. But it doesn't matter. It's still yeah. uh, a couple it. pounds of C4. Right. <laughs> yeah, and when that Claymore went off, then we lit up the NVA. That was the first time we could really see them. I, I want you guys to I want you guys to get the mental picture here, okay? Um, your rope was a little bit longer than the other guys. Yeah. So he's actually hanging a little below the other five guys on his team. You're getting hoisted up through a little hole in the jungle. Right. To a helicopter that is, they're not winching you up. They're no. actually the helicopter is starting lift. So you know it's not <laughs> being straight. It's going all over the place. Gunfire, you're supposed to be focusing on saving your own life, by the way. Indeed. Instead, you're watching <laughs> as the wire's starting to get taunt. Because I know I want it maximum distance. <laughs> While you're shooting your car 15 <laughs> with your other hand, and right before the wire gets taunt, you have the presence of mind to whack it, to tack off a claymore as you're yes. looking down at it. 50 feet away. Brother, I wouldn't do that in peacetime. Well, you the, couldn't get me to detonate a Claymore mine unless I was like behind a tree. And you're looking down at this and you're a freaking nutbag, dude. We nut were. Nutbag. Nutbag. No. Yeah. Thank you. Nutbag. I have a question on the Claymores. <laughs> did you ever have any situations where it didn't go off on the first clack or did they always go off? They went off. You never had to do the Claymore, the Claymore, Claymore? Because <laughs> no. they always taught us that you had to do it three times. Claymore, Claymore, Claymore. Yeah, you had to do it three Ooh. times. No, you didn't. No, we were very work. fortunate. Uh, they, we, they went off on the first one. We always, there was no counting. Dude. Well, you know, our my <laughs> one ones, my assistant team leaders were very good at making sure the, the clackers yeah. worked. Yeah. So we didn't clack around. Nice. Rick, nice. Uh, you picked the right hero, dude. You really yeah. did. You, you picked the right guy. Well, the insane uh, asylum, perhaps. Wow. Yeah. Hey, Rick, what do you think about hey. John coming down to Round Canopy in October, seeing how it's the Vietnam themed event? Oh, I. I think that I think that is an excellent idea. I wish I would have thought of that. All right, Operation Black Cat. <laughs> I think we need to call is, Bill. Operation Black Cat is the last weekend. It's the last week in October. All right, brother, I'm not asking you to jump. Uh, you understand what kind of trouble I would get into if I <laughs> broke or killed an American icon? No, you can sit right next to Randy Rawhide Worst, and you guys can watch. Um, but brother, that they're Guys, the, the, the video for the Round Canopy Parachute Team comes out in, I, I think, two weeks. But, um, I, you know, I brought my son down there. I right. brought Chad, our whole team. We went down, and uh, it was the, their spring event. Uh, Sand Snake is World War II theme. Uh, basically, the, we jumped out of the C-47. Really? Like they did in the Market Garden and everything. It was beautiful, oh. beautiful time. Um their hey, fall Carl, I'll, I'll event get with, um, is Black Cat. I'll, I'll get with um, Billy. Mark him. Yeah. And I, I don't know if he's already identified a guest speaker, but if uh, if John's amiable to doing that, I mean, he would be the perfect guest speaker for that Dude, event. you would be the yeah. perfect guest. But you understand. Yeah, it, plus, John, I, I, got, I got all your kit, man. My I copied son's... everything out of your book. Yeah, I heard that. Yeah, I'm sure. <laughs> so, my reliable son... sources told me my that, My son's <laughs> birthday present in June, he's getting... Vietnam era tiger stripe, so we can jump out of the UH one. Is that right? You're a rig, basically. <laughs> oh yeah. So yeah. Um, well, here's a here's a. Uh, 
October the 18th to the 22nd is the Special Operations Association reunion in Lost Wages. Las o Vegas. Uh, Lost Wages. Lost yeah, Wages, That's yeah. pretty accurate. <laughs> October 22nd to October 26th is the SFA reunion. They're back to back <coughs> for the first time in history. Mm, that's, and that's one of the boo. guest speakers at the SFA will be... You. <laughs> oh, no, no. Well, yeah, but the really the important one is Jocko. Jocko's, Jocko's book for that right. SFA um, reunion. So if that's, I'm we may, it we up, may be in conflict, Rick. I, but if you can fly me down and get a Blackbird I will flight. I fly that ass <laughs> down there for the final, all right, July, August, September, September October. 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 Now it's... Um, Ends one November, so that means it's no, no, the, no, no, the no, final no. jump. Oh, that's 2020. My bad, I read the wrong no, one. No, it's 21st <laughs> through the 25th. You're right, you're not going to be there, brother. Conflict. Well, mate, where is there? Florida. Um, Palatka, Florida. Ooh. That's a long hike. We'll do some homework. Yeah, we'll work on it. We'll bribe them. Rick, we'll bribe them. Hey, Rick, we'll can we just borrow your private jet for a night? <laughs> <laughs> I wish. <laughs> hey, hey, but John, you you, uh, you mentioned the, the Covey. Yes. And uh, you know what they're looking, you know, at, you know they lost those kids. Uh, third group lost those kids in uh, Niger. Right, because they, uh, they they didn't yeah. have armed Overwatch, and uh, I mean they're they're trying to call in French mirages. There's the language difficulty. I oh mean, they're uh, you know, trying to mark guys on the ground, and it uh, you know just the, the difference in the you know the, the whole tactics things. Yeah. So one of the things that AFSOC is looking at is they they, they want armed Overwatch, and uh, so they were looking at a Super Tacano, but there's also an OV uh, OV10 Bronco, a Bronco Two. Sure. Really, they're gonna bring the Bronco back. The Bronco and, was a uh, badass plane back in the day. Well, they, that, that's I think that's one of the ones that uh, that may be in the running, but uh, it'll, they they actually want a pilot in it, somebody that you can talk to, and uh, yeah. you can do the sensors and uh, and drop ordnance. Well, don't forget, and, and it's something yeah. that you can take with you. So, yeah. Rick, you're, what you're saying is you have a an Air Force or a pilot. But more importantly, you have somebody riding with him to do the tactical stuff. That's right? what they're talking about, uh, bringing somebody yep. that uh, wow. he goes with you. Sure. Um, what, we're, what we're running right now basically is, um, and don't get me wrong, AC-130s are awesome. The, the current spooky, you know, it's got, uh, they did away, back in your day, there was the C-47 with the 762 minigun. Well, don't forget, we had the whole, yeah. we had the whole, a progression. Yeah. Spooky was first. Then they had um, Shadow, which was a C-119 with okay. more guns. Yeah. Then they came out with Stingers, which again were the C-119 with more weaponry, more computers, and then Spectre. Yeah. And that's one night we went through four of those over in Leon's. We, uh, Spectres, when I basically came in, they were running 20, 20 millimeter uh, Vulcans. Gatlin guns. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And then they had the 40 millimeter boffers, the 105 howitzer. They progressed, they replaced, they basically pressurized the plane now. So now it can fly higher. Right. But what they found was the 20 millimeters, you get too high of a dud rate because the added altitude, the rounds destabilize and start to tumble. So they went to a 25 millimeter Gatlin gun, two of them per plane. Still have the 40 millimeters, still have the. Um, uh, the 40 millimeter buffers still have the 105, but now the plane is pressurized. And um, wow. insanely, insanely accurate. I, I won't mention minimum safe distance, but uh, it's like that movie, Danger Close. Yeah, no, it's it's <laughs> stupid close. Um, but now they they can actually drop large ordnance out of the out of the back of the plane that is like guided. Let, let me ask you a technical stuff. question here. Now, when you call it danger close today, do you still like in 1970 in February when I called it danger close? The Air Force goes, you have to say first that you will accept any casualties that we inflict? You know, um, I and believe so. I have no, no, and here's why I say that. Um, the Air Force doesn't want to take blame for anything. No, of course. And, but understand, the initial invasion of Afghanistan, the Air Force killed more Green Berets than the Taliban did. Indeed. The initial invasion of Iraq in 03, the Air Force killed more Green Berets than Saddam and Sane's whole oh. army did. Um, and and not, 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 not intentionally, not either. just their fault, part of it, part of playing the game. Um, but as far as do we have to accept 
you on the radio, do you have to accept responsibility? I honestly don't know because I don't know of a commander that was ever put into that um, position. Well, I will say we use kinetic points and everything, and uh, I won't get into the tactics and stuff. This is open internet. Um, yeah, we no, don't do we don't tactics on the internet. We do no. tips, techniques. We, we share open source data. We don't do tactics here. Um, 50 year old tactics. Are yes. Okay yeah. Yes. Um, <laughs> but like you just mentioned, you emptied four in one night. Yeah. Um, my old unit, and I, I was not there. I flew in to do sensitive site exploitation that night. It was, I want to say 2007 in the Joff, 2007, 2000, 2007, um, down in the Joff, it's an army of heaven. My old unit just happened to be driving by and they heard another A-team in contact. And long, long story short, they emptied one spooky of every shell that the plane had, which is insane. I'd never even heard of it happening. Really? They em a second one came on station. Oh. They emptied that one. Yeah. The first one came back loaded to the gills. They emptied that one. And then the second plane came back loaded to the gills. And they were half, emptied that one halfway before they ran out of... Fuel? Uh, no, uh, sunlight. They, the, the, they oh. will not fly during the day. No, no, no. So the sun was starting to come up, so it had to flee. Now, that's... And don't get me wrong, I'm the bravest guy on the planet <laughs> so long as I have a spooky over my head. Oh, yeah. But... One thing I will say, though, is that's one thing that bothers me about them is they will not fly during the day. And that's why when Rick just said they're thinking about bringing a, uh, a dedicated sure. Covey back, I, I think that is awesome. I, be, it worked. I mean, we worked it to a Oh, team. yeah. No, uh, please, please get please. If you're one of the decision makers up at Starfleet Command right now or at that weird shaped building at the Pentagon... Uh. Please give our warfighters what they need because what we don't need is more mandatory briefings on how many different genders there are now. And what sexual need, orientation, don't forget uh, that. What we need now are uh, support for our warfighters. The next battle may be conventional. And if it's yeah, conventional, you, you know, it's going to be awesome. Carl, one of the things you're looking at too is the... Uh, because it, it, if, if you bring in a Spectre, if you bring in uh, your A-10s, if you bring in anything that... Uh, I mean, you remember when we were sitting in Djibouti and we yep. brought those uh, four AFSOC hel helicopters in. Yep. And, I mean, the hundreds of guys that had to come with it, additional engines, you know, the, uh, you know, the hot, hot pallet for the, uh, for the ammunition. So, so if you're just... If you're, do, if you're an ODA going into Africa, the, uh, you can take one or two of those little aircraft with you on a C-5. Yeah. And, uh, and, and you've got your own, you know, with a couple of mechanics. So... So the, the overhead and the, 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 the resource requirements, the logistics isn't as heavy as uh, with some of the other platforms. So and I think it's, I think they're really onto something great. No, that is, that is awesome. And uh, like Rick just said, uh, from a logistics standpoint, a fixed wing aircraft is so much less maintenance than rotary wing. Trying to compare a Cessna to a Blackhawk is, the levels of maintenance are just insanely different, insanely different. So no, that's that's great. No, great news, Rick. Yeah, and uh, we can just give them a couple of our books and let them read about how we did it fifty years ago. Yeah. <laughs> and the Broncos, God, we I never had any. We we never saw any Broncos until nineteen seventy. Yeah, because before that there were the old Puss Pools, the O uh, O twos, mm -hmm. the old Cessnas. Well, well, John, one of the things that uh, that we did the. Uh, the, the GSF has a, um, a gig up in Washington, D.C. Uh, for the imperatives. So, uh, so we were able to get the ASOC commander. I mean, we had a, uh, a former Green Beret congressman from uh, here in Florida. And then we had a yeah. former Ranger. Uh, District 6. Uh, congressman from uh, Colorado. Yeah. So uh, one, one's a Democrat, one's a Republican. And, uh, but again, the, they had the military in common, right? So yeah. you've got... Uh, the AFSOC commander in the center, and he's running this this two man paddle back and forth, and they're just they're cutting up back and forth like GIs tend to do. And uh, you know, Waltz goes, "Hey man, I'm uh, I'm surprised that you're not a Republican." And uh, <laughs> you're just back and forth. But but they they were so 
heavy on armed overwatch that uh, they were they were able to uh, to convince the decision makers that you know they needed to you know because Congress con- controls the purse strings that those guys needed to uh, to push money. So I think one of the things that uh, that USASOC may want to do uh, during their Modern Warfare Symposium, uh, one of the things we're talking to them is is to bring bring some graybeards back. Yeah, and, for, uh, you, for sure. You, you, you got to pick these you, guys' you, brains. Yeah, well, you, you were top on the list. The uh, to, to come in and actually speak to all the commanders during their uh, because you know, we're, we're going back into great power competition. And, yeah, uh, and, the, the uh, communism was the reason the Green Berets were formed in the first place. And, and you uh, you mentioned it all the time, Rick, that uh, we always take a um, a face shot at the at the beginning of every conflict because we're when we go into peacetime, we're always worried about the last war. And, and we can't uh, afford that anymore. Yeah, no, we can't. We literally can't because the next. And I tell people all the time we're entering a cold war with China. And when I use the war, the phrase cold war, everybody goes, "Well, you know, it's no big deal, no big deal." And and that's because they, we won the last cold war. Um, but right now we are not winning this. We we are so behind the power curve, and uh, people need to wake up. All right, hey, uh, John. Well, we, just one last thing yep. for Sergeant um, Sergeant Major Lamb. Uh, Ken, uh, retired Major General Ken Bore, he was yes. the last uh, one zero for my team, Idaho. More importantly, he has a depth of knowledge that's second to none. I, I, I'm, uh, I, I talk to him probably twice a week. <laughs> oh, okay. Yeah. <laughs> he's, nice. <laughs> he's another one, of, one, another one of my heroes. Oh, yeah, there he's, he's but, at the uh, top yeah, I was, of the list. Uh, it, as I was building the SOG uh, gear, yeah, yeah, I would, uh, you know, the, the kit, because I, I, I try to replicate as, as closely as I can, and uh, so I would send him pictures of, uh, hey, did you wear it like this? Did you wear it like that? And uh, <laughs> yeah, because one, one of the things I mean that you guys pioneered was, uh, you know, the use of um, uh, canteen covers. Yeah, and the, um, the fact that yeah. the fact that you could get twenty, M79. you could get five twenty round, <laughs> five twenty twenty round magazines, and then a sixth. You know, a thirty-round magazine, so you could actually get you know five and five and one in each one of those. And I mean, some of the the basic loads, it was, he, he was taking seven hundred and twenty rounds oh, uh, in on that belt. And, and don't said, forget, is, don't forget too, we had the uh, M seventy nine rounds of the uh, uh, true. 40, yeah. I, I, so <laughs> I, I said, hey, was uh, was that excessive? And uh, and he said no. On one particularly bad day, he says I was down to my last twenty round magazine. That's just crazy. Seven hundred and twenty. And, and we got people today that bitch that. Well, you know, you're you're stupid, Carl. You're stupid because you've got ten magazines. You know, you're stupid. All you need is three. You'll never need more than three on your kit. Yeah, that's right. what that's what a rent would uh, say. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> I, I got a question here from uh, one of our donors in Donor Box. Says Sergeant Meyer, <clears throat> did you ever do any missions with Colonel Robert L. Howard, Medal of Honor? Served with him when he was a captain in Second Ranger Battalion, best soldier and leader I ever had in 23 years of service. Rangers lead the way. That is from Juan Robles. I'm assuming. Uh, Colonel Robert L. Howard uh, was a he, Vietnam vet. He's a, he ran recon out of Contum, out of CCC, and he was put in for the Medal of Honor three times in 1968. The third time, he got it. And he was a sergeant. He and was then a sergeant after, back then. After the medal was awarded, and while they're waiting for uh, President Johnson to, uh, to put it on his neck, he got promoted to lieutenant, so they could say an officer got it. <laughs> Uh, but that's okay. That's just a little highlight. But but in, in answer to Bob Howard, he was a complete and total stud. And uh, All right, so I thought you were going to say he was uh, worthless. No, he's oh a good no guy. no no. Are you kidding good me? Guy? He's the real deal. I mean, that's Bob awesome. Howard, we, somebody we all looked up to. You know, yeah. in Vietnam in '68, they had it every month. There was a Green Beret magazine came out, and in it there was awards and decorations. Virtually every month in 68, Bob Howard, Purple Heart, Bob Howard, Silver Star, Bronze Star. And it's like, he got a distinguished service cross. I remember reading it because a friend of mine I went to Nam with, his last yeah. name was Howard, Rick Howard, yeah. a good friend of mine. And I go, Rick, hey, your cousin Bob Howard got another award. You know, by Christmas, he's going to be dead. This guy's got so many medals. Well, <laughs> not only did he survive, he got the Medal of Honor. Oh. And the majority of the times he got put in for it, he was a strap hanger. 
It wasn't even as a team leader. He'd be an S4. We're handing out supplies. They go, they need help. He strap on his gear and go. Just an amazing. <laughs> you know, soldier. John. He he was he was still hard as an old man. The uh, I think oh, he yeah. was a major. I went through the Q course in '86. I want to say, and uh, you know they, they used to take you right there to that traffic circle there at um, um, as you go out to the um, Camp McCall. Right, right. And then they they drop all your crap there, and you know, you get off the bus, <laughs> and uh, and then you grab all your stuff, and then you'd have to road march. It was just a mile, maybe a couple miles into the uh, into the compound there. And then, uh, you know, you're doing the flutter kicks and everything, and they're inspecting your bags, and uh, you're not supposed to have any contraband. And, and on right, the porch right. of that old that old um, shack that they used to have was <laughs> was Major Howard. Ooh. And then he's, drink, he's drinking a cup of coffee, and it goes through. I mean, we're, we're down on our backs. We're doing flutter kicks, and, and it goes it, – it ripples through the formation of guys that are just sucking on it that that's Bob Howard. That's the Medal of Honor guy. And then everybody, oh, yeah. hair on the back of your neck, stand it. And I mean, so you're, you're, you're just, everybody's now trying to do it exactly right. You know, the flutter kicks is you're just smoked, but it, but it, it had such a <laughs> jolt of motivation yeah. uh, into that. And then, of course on the rucksack marches, the guy's rucking. And uh, he was a guy that would go up to the front of the formation, to the back of the formation, around the formation. I mean, so he's, he's walking like three times the distance, but just spurring guys on. I mean, the, the, one of the awesome, awesome guy. That's cool. Very, very cool. Oh, yeah. All right, we got another one. Uh, James Swain. He's my uncle down in Texas. Hey, gentlemen. Carl, thanks for highlighting another great American. I got uh, two of them on the line right now. I really appreciate it. You've got to talk about Rick Lamb. <laughs> That's exactly what he's talking about. I there really appreciate you letting us get to know them better through this type of platform. Guys, um, I want to. Th- I don't want to thank John this time. I want to thank Chad. He's the guy right off, uh, right off the line here. Indeed. Um, Leviathan uh, hit us up about two years ago. They're like, "Hey, Carl, you've got to start doing live streams. You got to start doing live streams." And I was like, "Meh, nah, I really don't want to. I could care less about sitting around just talking." And Ch- this was Chad's basically idea. Carl, we can do this. Carl, we can do this. It's a <laughs> chance for us to interact. Nobody even knew who Chad was because Chad was always behind the camera right. making all the magic happen. But uh, now the world knows what a Chad Holsizer is. And, uh, With anyways, Chad's skill and Chad's uh, talent, dude, we can go places. Uh, I, <laughs> I have, uh, for during COVID, we were doing three live streams a week. Really? We're only putting out one regular video right. a week. We put, we put out a new video every Friday. Right. Um, uh, shit, three of them were Rick's videos. Um, but <laughs> great videos, uh, too, by the great way. Great videos. But, um, the cool part is literally, um, those three extra times a week, we were able to keep Tactical Rifleman afloat last year. We really were. And it was a, a, a lot of people got to see a side of us that they don't they don't get in the video. It's so. it's funny you say that because when I was on the Freedom Friends a podcast here two weeks ago, a week ago, whatever, uh, somebody asked about it and they were like, "Well, what do you guys mainly do?" And I was like, "Well, it's kind of complicated. It's not an easy <laughs> answer." I said because th- I can't really put one single thing on it, but it started as a YouTube channel that was meant to feed classes for Carl at T1G. Yeah. And then it rolled into doing videos about other stuff. And then majority of the content now is doing the live streams, if you want to say that, because that's kind of how it is. But somebody said something about it. And I said, yeah, well, it's funny because when before we started doing the live streams, a lot of the comments, they thought Carl was putting on a shtick. It was like, it was a shtick. They didn't realize, they thought Carl was just, it, that was his camera personality, right? <laughs> and but when we started doing the live streams, they're like, "Wait a minute, this guy is a fucking nutbag. He's yeah. like this all the time." Yeah, I'm, ask my wife; she'll tell you. I yeah. am. Uh, I, I guys, I'm so past <laughs> having to pretend in my life anymore. Yeah. Indeed, I don't have to. I, I'm I'm done lying. I call an apple an apple. I call I call an ugly baby an ugly baby, and if it hurts mama's feelings, I'm I'm sorry. All you know. Uh, Most in Canadian tastes like shit, and I know because we just the video came out this morning. If you want to go watch it on Freedom Fronts podcast, the de- <laughs> the debate video about Canadian beer. Mm. Sharon okay. Bostock is saying uh, that right. it's good beer, rookie. You all don't right. know what you're talking about. 
right, Chad, how about another question from uh, over here at Daughter Box? Let's see. Well, he's asking about the Colonel Paul Longrear and one question box here. Where, right here? Uh, scroll more back. There you go, right there. Uh, Colonel Paul Longrear, he was the second or first lieutenant at Lang Vey. Right at the start of Tet, 1968, Lang Vey was A101, and it was the first camp to get hit by tanks during the Vietnam War. Oh, yeah, 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 yeah. yeah and yeah. Uh, they had been sent up with the Mike Force to relieve, help the camp, and they were in the command bunker all night, and the NVA were dropping. Couldn't, couldn't get them out, right? Couldn't get yeah, them out. Yeah. And then in the morning, uh, the helicopters came out, but the Marines kept circling. And finally, one of the aviators from the you know, 176th went down. First ones to land, pick them up, and began to take the, take the uh, men out to survive the battle. Guys, that's a, um, that's a 90 second cliff note right there. If you're looking for a good story uh, about never quit, no matter how oh. bad the odds are stacked against you, no matter, and that's one of the things we and like to do. here's the book. The yeah, book is yeah. called Route 9, because that's the highway that went by Langvey. Okay. Route 9 problem. And the NVA called it a Route 9 problem because they couldn't get the case on to battle the Marines. They were hung up on Langvey. And the camp kept hurting their efforts to get over there. And, so they brought uh, tanks in. Yeah, and then, of course, mm -hmm. the sidebar to the sidebar, yep. we had FOB-3 at Quezon running missions across the fence. <laughs> but all the books talk about the Marine Corps just getting bombed day and night. And we were still running missions. <laughs> That's funny. Good stuff. Good oh, stuff. yeah. All right, I got another one here from Russell Ridge. Uh, the Merry anonymous Christmas. one. I'm sorry, from an anonymous donor named Russell. Uh, Merry Christmas. Uh, seems like it. Uh, no tilt is coming. Saw him first on Team House and always look forward to his humor and wisdom. Go to lunch and meet Dan, uh, Dana Bowman, 7th SF, Golden Knights guy, lost his legs in tragic midair collision. Whoa. Would still be talking to him, but he had to go dive in the rodeo with U.S. flag in tow tonight. Um, prosthetics, unbelievable. Wow. Get to work and get 200 a week raise out of <laughs> Clear Blue. This is for Chad. If we can save Ragnar's vision, we can get Trouble Hook out of Chad's ass so he can move faster for Carl. <laughs> uh, it's not a Trouble Hook, guys. Uh, it's a boot. Yeah, don't judge a guy for having pierced nipples. Don't. My nipples are no, not pierced. Chad, We've been through this. Hardest worker on Team TR. Glad to share my bounty with him. Thank you, uh, anonymous uh, thank donor you, Russell. Thank you, anonymous donor Russell. Russell. Mr. Ridge, that was awesome. Thank you, by the way. <laughs> you know, hey, you knew what you were getting into, Russell, when you put that, click that little button. That one's on you, brother. Oh, uh, let's do one more. Let's do one more. This one is from Le Leblanc, who another Frenchman. Indeed. Indeed. They're everywhere. Well, he's, there ain't nothing French about Leaf except maybe uh except maybe uh the, the croissants he's knocking back. Uh, he's always uh, assaulting Ford. He yeah. it's funny because when we jumped, the only person on the team besides Carl that had uh uh the little the mustard stain, yeah. right? Uh, I don't have. I don't oh, have you don't a even have one. I don't have a combat job. Okay, so he was the only one on the team TR that had a mustard stain. Yeah, he really. Uh, yeah, he was. A, I want to say an engineer and got drafted and jumped in with the Rangers into Panama. Whoa! So he actually got his mustard, uh, his gold. We call it mustard stain, but it's a gold star on your your jump wings. Leaf's awesome. Yeah, oh, uh, Leaf is good people. Leaf uh, it's a good good evening, gents. John, what happened to most of the King Bee pilots after the war? Did any make it to the U.S.? Thanks for blazing the path. Rangers lead the way. Wow, thank you. Um, yes, uh, just for viewers that aren't familiar with King Bees, they, in the Secret War, uh, particularly in the first four or five years, the primary air asset we had for getting our recon teams and hatchet forces in and pulled, more importantly pulled out from the target always under fire were the south vietnamese 219th special operations squadron aka the king bees king bees heroic um i think they had especially designed the seats and those things just to hold those king bee pilots balls 
They were just tremendous. <laughs> That's not what I thought you were going to say. Oh, yeah, no. <laughs> no <dude. laughs> but they were fearless. I'm alive today. Recon Team Idaho survived dozens of missions all under fire thanks to King Bee Pilots. Um, so at the end of the war, which was April 30th, 1975, um, several were placed at re-education camps. The most uh, hideous of all was Captain Tin, who has since been promoted, he's now a colonel, living in Arizona. But he was in a re-education camp for 13 and a half years. During the time he was- camp, hold on. Uh, yeah, for yeah. our viewers, he's not talking about a re-education camp here in the States, uh, in New Mexico. Where was this re-education camp? In Vietnam. In Vietnam. So uh, after the communists, after Saigon fell, April 30th, the communists came in, they killed over 100,000 people, and the process, <clears throat> those who surrendered would put in re-education camps so they would be indoctrinated to think like a commie. And the King B. Piles were just too how did far he get, ahead. How did he come to the States? He escaped. After 13 and a half years, he was able to escape. His <laughs> teeth were so bad that his, uh, all of his teeth had to be replaced. They had rotted away. But somehow... And this is, and, and Colonel Tin is indeed of the King Bee legends. He's one of the top because he had um, s saved John Walton, the recon team. And when, on that mission, it was a six man recon team. They got overrun. The third time they got overrun by an NVA wave attack, the 1 0 called in the A 1 Sky Raider that made a 20 mic mic run on the team. Killed one in the ditch. Two rounds hit uh, uh, spec four Tom Cunningham. First round hit the radio, exploded the shrapnel, wounded the one zero Pete Boggs. The second round, both of those lifted Tom Cunningham off the ground and severed his leg. So he had just some tissue or a sinew of some sort that held the bottom part of his leg on. And Tom was one of the few people who had an out of body experience where he saw himself flying through the air. <clears throat> after being hit by 20 mic mic rounds. Mm. And he thought he was dead. When he landed, he thought he was dead. Then he says, if I'm dead, he yelled out his name, Tom. And when he said his name, he returned to his body. Well, John T. Walton, who was the medic on that team, there was an indigent got shot four times. John brought him back. He brought back the one zero and Tom Cunningham saved his life. Mm. And then for people that are, know about our SF medics, who are so good, and John was the epitome of outstanding medics, when they got back to the Army base, they took in Pete Boggs, Tom Cunningham, and the uh, doctors stopped and would not let the indigent. John turned his car 15. Our, our guys are dirty, sweaty yeah. from the, being in the field. He goes, you will treat him or you will die. Well, needless to say, they put him in. The doctor <laughs> who was working in the E-room was so shaken by what had happened, he couldn't put the IV in. So John had to put in the IV for him. And in 19, as out, it was 2003, at the Special Operations Association reunion, John Walton flew his private jet to Fargo, North Dakota, picked up Colonel Tin, his wife, his son, flew him back to the reunion, paid for everything, and then flew him home. See, that's badass. Yeah, that's... he told his son, he says, never forget this man, he saved my life. That's the way John was, just yeah. a class Green Beret all the way through. Awesome, awesome, awesome. So, yes, we some stayed. Colonel Tim was the worst one. Um, this year at the Special Operations Association, there will be, we're going to honor the King Bee pilots and their crew. And we know of at least more than a dozen that are still alive. They're in the States. And then cool. sadly, uh, we buried uh, Captain Tuong last year, who saved me on Christmas Day. And when I had the embarrassment of being upside down and passing out from choking out of my gear, um, Captain Tuong saved my life that day. Uh, guys, that is another business card. And <laughs> I think it's in this book right here. No, guys, uh, right now you're saying, tell, tell the story, tell the story, tell the story. Guys... John is a great storyteller, and I'm telling you, if you don't have these books in your collection, uh, you really need <laughs> to get these books because they are awesome stories. You mentioned getting lit up by a 20 millimeter. Um, 
your team uh, got you you brought strafes in from um, Spectre. Uh, no, it wasn't a Spectre. It was a uh, Phantom. Right? Oh, one of the one of the stories in here. Yeah, also well, with, yeah, we were in. we had we were under attack for a couple hours. We couldn't get any attack air, and finally attack air arrived. That's the first time we ever used the fast movers. And they told us, you know, it's one thing in training. Yeah. Uh, when you use a jet, the rounds will land before you hear the jet. They go, okay, that's cool. Yeah, fine. Next thing. Well, when you ask me, when that happens, <laughs> <laughs> and that jungle explodes with the rounds from a gun run. Oh, my God. I'll, yeah, we'll never forget that. Of course, uh, then we had, our, we had the A1 Sky Raiders. Yeah. That were our version of the, what you guys A10, love, your A10, yeah. your old warthogs. You had the prop. Uh, they had props on Single yeah, prop. Single prop. And they carried a CBU, napalm, the whole nine yards. And... and it was a spad. It was the first time they made a, such a close gun run to us. It was the first time I had 7.62 shell casings in the back of my neck. <laughs> <laughs> That's awesome. That's close. You know, and, uh, but, and there was another time. Uh, my, in fact, my last mission, when the Sky Reader came in, he made a gun run. He came back and made a second gun run. He flipped his plane just a little bit so I could see him because yeah. he wanted to make sure where we were. We yeah. had a four-man team. He was so close, I could tell you he was smoking a Philly cheroot. Oh, shit. That's how close he was. Those guys were amazing. <laughs> That's awesome. And I think about, um, I think about us getting on the helicopters in, in Afghanistan, getting on the helicopters in Iraq. Nada. We didn't do none of this stuff. We didn't do none of this stuff. We didn't do any, No. Well, uh, at one time no. we got pulled up by, by Colonel Tin. He mm. came back the next day and said, my King B had 48 bullet holes in it. <laughs> Jim Shorten had one where he had over 100 uh, bullet holes in a King B. Damn. Oh, yeah. They, those old H-34s right. could take hits. Uh, next one's from one of my patrons, uh, Wayne Owanski. Good evening, comma. Sergeant Myers, can you describe an apical? Or apical. Apical or most challenging, life-changing decision in which you didn't know the outcome from your time in Vietnam or otherwise. Brother, <laughs> there's about 500 of them in here. <laughs> this was a daily thing. Dude, it, every, you understand, like by every three pages, I was like, <laughs> that would have changed my life right there. And then I get to the next page, man, my life just changed again. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> wow. Um, Go ahead. Well, well, there was a few times, but I think the... Uh, a few, just a few, John. Yeah, a little bit more like, too. But <laughs> we had a perfect ambush set up, and we were talking about where we we're going to go for R and R. Because if you get a POW, you were already counting five your, day R and R. You get a hundred dollar bonus. Before they we were, oh we yeah, were, oh yeah, oh yeah. And John and perfect Bob and I ambush. were debating Hawaii, Australia. Perfect and then, ambush. Yeah, right. The only trouble was the weather closed in, and Covey couldn't. He's at ten thousand feet and couldn't see the mountain we were on. So that led us to E and E for a day and a night, and that was the night where the guy came in. The NVA crawled up the bank and touched my boot. Touch your boot. That's one of those moments you 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 don't forget. It's like literally, I'm I'm. Yeah, he he, he didn't move, and this guy was really good. He only moved when the wind blew. Um, John's a good storyteller, guys. When he tells this story, um, again, it's <laughs> I would say it's that business card right there. <laughs> They hear him tell it, and that his biggest fear is, can this guy hear my heart beating? Absolutely. Because it was oh. beating that hard. Um, they were, we were close. <laughs> <laughs> I have been hidden from cops at keg parties when I was a kid, <laughs> and I thought for sure they, they could hear my heart beating that hard. And, um, but never, never in a combat zone like that, never. Oh, dude. So, John. Great story. Great what, story. Oh, yeah. How I'd probably I, be lucky and good any day. How do I word this? Because that the questions, they kind of are beating around a thing. Mm. Tell us about your, your mental thought processes in the, during that time. Like, uh, obviously, they say that if you're scared, you need to quit, that kind of thing. You had to have been scared or concerned, but that keeps you on your toes. Tell us about the whole where you were mentally in that time, 
when you're getting ready to go on missions, going into the jungle, like what kind of things are going through your head at this time? Or you, you get what I'm saying? Like, oh, what? yeah, yeah. Well, the, the answer is um, when I read the book, the, the Green Berets were the leading force in the war. And I wanted an opportunity to try to become one of them. Mm -hmm. We got in, we had our top secret briefing, and you know the briefing starts because we've been in class for like 15 months. And so we all pulled our pens and pads out. And the sergeant major comes and says, put that shit away. This is a top secret briefing. <laughs> Bingo. From that day on, we knew that we were part of the best operation with the best troops in, in the world at that time. And uh, so we never thought about it in terms of, oh, God, if, what, if, what if I die today? Mm -hmm. we got to get this job done. How can we do it better? And how can we improve? And how can we hurt the enemy the most while doing our missions? And um, there were times when it was difficult, and we lost a lot of good men in the process. Mm -hmm. I mean, today, right as of today, there's still 50 Green Berets that are MIA and lay us alone. Plus, we have 80-plus aviators. We were talking F-1, I mean the F-4s, Phantom Jet, A-1 Sky Raider, helicopter pilots, mm -hmm. uh, Marine Corps, including Scarface, mm -hmm. that supported us throughout the entire war, that are all part of the missing in action just in layoffs from the secret war. So in our day, uh, at least in my case, it was we're proud of being where we are. We're the, we wore the tip of the spear then, although nobody phrased it that way. Did I answer the question? Yeah. yeah. Well, I, I wanted people to hear that it wasn't that you weren't scared. Oh, yeah, we're scared. It's, if you're not yeah. scared, I don't want you on my team. Yeah. Because this, you got to have that balance. It's a good thing to have fear, but you got to be able to live with it, mm -hmm. not let it overcome you. Like one of our teams that was on the ground for an entire day with a firefight, the son of a general who was on the team prayed, had his face in the ground all day, never fired one round in anger. That was his last mission, by the way. Yeah, I, I, I bet. I bet. <laughs> no, I, and Stop. What? We died. We got to restart. We froze. Just like my couch. Screen. There. <laughs> yep. There's our Major Rick Lamb. Oh. It's just you and me, Rick. So uh, any more final thoughts from your end, sir? What, for, uh, for, for you? For you or me, yes, sir. We're together oh, here God. chatting, and then, and then we've lost Carl to the latrine for a yeah. few minutes. But we're back. We're streaming again. So uh, I don't know what happened there. I don't know if YouTube whacked us real quick or something. <laughs> Who knows? <laughs> Who knows? Doesn't matter. <laughs> so uh, what do you think, Rick, when you were ex expound... Ex Expound on what he was talking about before we froze. What what is kind of one of the things in your time that kind of kept you through? What was your motivation? Uh, working through the fear, the mission, blah blah blah. You know, what are you? I, I, yeah, I think I think the whole thing is um, it, it's probably a re, re, reoccurring theme. No, because you, you just don't want to you don't want to let your buddy down. Yeah. The, uh, yeah, because you, you're always told, man, if one guy right, runs, everybody Rick's runs. Talk. Rick's talk. Should be, uh... Put your ears in, <laughs> Carl. Go ahead. I, I, just to, you don't want to let your buddy down? Yeah, absolutely. You know, the, the, the love you have for the guy to your left and right and the camaraderie, it's, uh, I'm, I'm not going to be the guy that uh, is the weak link. No one's going to stumble because I failed to motivate. Nice, good answer. Well, and then also, it's um, there is that adrenaline rush. True. Yeah. When you you're in the middle of that combat, there's something about that adrenaline rush that's second to none. Well, and, and you know what? When Carl was talking about, uh, you know, you're up there, you're on the, you're on the line. You got uh, a car 15 in one hand. You got the claymore clacker in the other, and you're watching the, uh, you're watching the, 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 the line unravel, because you actually were, because everything that. Uh, yeah, when the adrenaline's rushing, everything goes to your eyes, and uh, so all, all the blood is with your eyes. I mean, you're in the, you're in fight or flight, and it, 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 everything slows down, and and it's just the most pristine, you know, uh, thought pattern that you've got going through because you're uh, you're fixing to die, and uh, so so yeah, that, that's exactly what happened. Is you were you were doing all that stuff because you were focused on it. Oh yeah, absolutely. Yeah, in that, in that case, we we're like 
We're, we were in we were in flight and in a fight. <laughs> <laughs> he was in fight and flight. Yeah, that's my nick and my nickname Tilt from from too many extractions on the rope. Tilt was like I felt like the human pinball ricocheting off the trees when the helicopter pilots kind of couldn't go straight up, and uh, and I understood from where they were sitting, they were taking incoming fire. And from where we're hanging, it's kind of like, can you please get us above the trees before we E&E? &E? <laughs> They're literally dragging you through the treetops. Yeah. That's funny as hell. Oh, yeah. Um, Rick, did you, uh, Rick said he got to do um, Rope Stabo. I got to do it in training a few times. I remember being a private and uh, just, I think I was E3, uh, E3, E4, E4. I just got the Fort Campbell Recon Platoon 101st. We had tons of helicopters in uh, February. February. Uh, we got to do the Stabo, and um, they got the, the harnesses coming yeah. down. You hook them on the shoulders. Well, they bring out two of us at a time, and the Black Hawk, uh, we got the little pond on Fort Campbell. They would always dunk the new guys that had never done it before. Oh, in no, the really? Dunk them oh. in the pond and then fly them a couple more laps. Oh, that's cold. And you are completely um, <laughs> helpless. There, There's no unhooking. There's no reaching up with your knife like uh, Sylvester Stallone and cutting yourself free. You are completely helpless hanging underneath that helicopter. You know, and that's, that's a pilot thing. Yeah, the because uh, they, they would do the same thing in Panama, and uh, but they take you and they, they dunk you in the ocean, and, and as you're flying over, I mean, you can you could actually see the sharks, <laughs> and uh, so, so it wasn't that funny. <laughs> oh my god! Uh, I tell you what, after um, getting dunked in February, uh, at where it's oh, I don't know, um, thirty three degrees before wind chill factor, and then getting dunked in the water, I think I'd rather have sharks than uh, that 15 minute <laughs> helicopter ride back to where, and it was a long ways to get to that pond. I'm here to tell you, long ride to and get to the pond. And to think I hated ghillie washes. That's mm. ghillie wash at, at a whole yeah, but see, different like, level. Here's a question for you. You guys that use the uh, stable rig, yeah. if you were in it for a half hour or 45 minutes, when you landed, you could get up and walk. <laughs> when yeah, you true. use you the could. Swiss seat, no, you are oh, screwed. Yeah. Oh, yeah. No, dude. I, and in the 101st, we grew up with the, the Swiss seats. Everybody carried their rope, and it was all just like you guys did. Yeah. But, um, yeah, fast forward, there are so many better harnesses out there now. Oh, yeah, yeah. <laughs> oh, great. I'm like, why were we not using this back then? Tell me why. Because I, well, they, 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 they came out with stable rigs. It's just that uh, some of us just a little slow in adapting. And I feel yeah. like redesigning yeah. all my web gear is like... <laughs> <laughs> this, um, I, I, we, we survived with the Swiss seat and being a cripple at the end of yeah. a few days. <laughs> and and earn the name <clears throat> Tilt because you were hanging upside down and passed out. Uh, <laughs> please. Next topic. Next story. And please. then and then Carl does a repelling video and uses like eighth inch blue uh, am uh, steel. steel line to like, repel. Okay. And he gets to the bottom, he's like, man, that fucking sucked. And then he goes, <laughs> all right, we got to do it again. And he goes to the top and he does it again. He's like, that was a bad idea. That was a bad idea. I well, needed to do it for the video. Well, we were showing expedient repelling. Well, don't forget the all-time SOG repelling story, which was Dick Thompson, <clears throat> which begins when Dick was going to the CCN headquarters for his R&R. &R. Yeah. And just, just, to the, just to the west of that is our helicopter pad. He's going into the headquarters, and somebody goes, Hey, Dick, come help us. There's a team in trouble. We have to put the rope in for the strings that pick out these, uh, the guys that are in trouble. So Dick, of course, being an officer and all, lays his weapon down and his ammo down oh, no. and jumps into the chopper, ties the rope down. As he's tying the rope down, it takes off. <laughs> <laughs> he goes, he tells the pilot, I'm not supposed to be here. I'm going to go on R&R. &R. And the pilot goes, you're with us. <laughs> so here's, here's Lieutenant Dick Thompson. And of course, by then he was the first lieutenant. So at least he got promoted. <clears throat> but this is the all-time favorite story. He flies out. He gets out over the target. He borrows the door gunners, M16. He borrows his... his uh, you know, the bandolier with yeah. the five is yep. a five. Yep. So it had five magazines yep. five in mags. it. And he has no gums. 
He throws the ropes down. So he goes, maybe I can get to the bottom of a 150-foot rope without gloves. Oh. As he's gone down the rope, and the rope began to turn red from the blood on his hands, <laughs> Lieutenant Thompson realized that he wasn't going to quite make it. Now, here's the added part. The footnote is the helicopter began to lift off at the end of the rope. So the rope was no longer in the jungle. Oh. Dick ran out of rope. <laughs> he let go. Free fell into a 150-foot triple canopy, broke three ribs and another bone. <laughs> and then while he's falling, the magazine in the M16 is ejected. He's down to five magazines. He gets to the ground, puts a new magazine in. He goes 30 or 40 feet, and he sees two enemy. He had trained himself to how to fall and shoot at the same time. So he fell and killed those two, completed the mission. It was a bright light. He brought everybody back. He forgot one person. They made him go back two days later to get that person who had fried in a helicopter crash. So that's my all-time... I feel like a wimp after I tell that story. Dick Thompson is one of our all-time legends. And he's still alive and happy today. In fact... You he, earn legend status uh, by being, and people ask me like, well, Carl, you know that stuff's hard. I'm like, no, combat is Keystone Cops. <laughs> it is 30 days of boredom for 30 seconds of excitement, at, uh, right? Because you might actually oh, yeah. be getting ready to go on R and R. That's why they tell you never volunteer. Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> exactly. Oh. <laughs> Daddy, why are you sitting in church in your suit and you've got a pair of leather gloves in your pocket? Honey, I will always have leather gloves with me for the rest of my life. The lessons learned because of pain and suffering. And blood on the rope. Blood yes. on the rope. Oh. oh, my God. Can you imagine that, though? Oh. Oh. Amazing. Uh, usually when you hear about a bloody rope. Uh, ah, nope. God uh, damn it, Carl. No. Next topic. No. <laughs> TMI, TMI. We got a question over here. TMI. <laughs> We got another one right here. Um, oh, we did wait. We, we did, did. Yeah, we away, got him away. away. He's covered. All right, this one is from <clears throat> Buford T. Justice. Little man said to say, great show tonight. Little man, um, I want you to lean over and give your father a big hug for me because he is one of the greatest Americans I've also met. Um, oh, okay. Great guy. All right, next one is... Well, pinball Machines. That's the answer. The Pinball Machines. Pinball Machines. That's how Tilt you... got his nickname. And he <laughs> talked about it a little bit here a little bit ago. Indeed. Thanks, Henry. And being a human pinball. Yeah. <laughs> human. This one is from the guy sitting right next to Heather Fly Fishes. His name is Phil W. He's a bush pilot up in Alaska. Sergeant Myers, comma. My best 05 was Napalm Carpenter. I know he was an advisor for a while. Did you ever work with him? Thanks for your time with Tactical Rifleman. You ever meet a guy named Napalm Carpenter? No, but with a name like that, I wish I had. Yeah. <laughs> sure. now, how do you get a cool name like Napalm? Yeah, no kidding. Yours is Tilt, right? I yeah. mean, <laughs> I know. <laughs> That's awesome. Good stuff indeed. All right. Um, Hold on. We've got another one coming Two up. More. They're everywhere. Ghost Anime. Guess I'll ask the hard questions. Um, no, we're going to skip that one. We're going to move on. All right. Uh, lots of great stuff here. David Lehman. Thanks, TR. Great show. Okay. No. Uh, sincerely, Rick. Um, you owe me, brother. You've <laughs> got to come up in July. Uh, I miss you too much. We are going to grill lamb chops for appetizer. <laughs> yes. uh, we're going to do black Angus. It's going to be awesome. Um, and um, we're going to have, uh, we'll have you come up, Till. And uh, I, guys, gents, we're going to do this again. I almost guarantee you that Eric uh, Christensen from Nutrient Survival, they're our proud uh, sponsor for tonight, Nutrient Survival. But I got a feeling they're going to jump on board with that also, get really? you guys together. Oh, um, I, dude, I'm so happy to work with that company. Uh, I'm, I'm big on survival and preparedness. Uh, you, you know the deal. As a Green Beret, our job never ends. And... 
That's true. Rick, right? We train to go behind enemy lines like the French resistance. Um, but the reality is, unfortunately, we may have to lead partisans in our own country. I pray not. I hope not. But if it happens, um, everybody needs to be prepared. And part of that is um, everybody wants to have guns and ammo. That's not preparedness. Preparedness is knowledge. But... Uh, Water, shelter, food, stuff like that. So, anyways, I'm happy to have partnered with Nutrient Survival, without a doubt. You got to get you hooked up with them. It's good stuff. Absolutely, good sounds stuff. like it. And uh, uh, speaking of our history, yeah, July 10th. July 10th. The legend of all of our legends that we all salute. Okay. Major General Jack K. Singlob will turn 100 on really? July the oh, 10th. Oh, that is so July awesome. 10th. Yeah. Nice. Now this is the man who, when he t after he turned ninety six, he had a heart valve replaced just so he could keep going. That's how tough Jack is. Damn. And for those who may not have seen his book Hazardous Duty, um, he was in UCLA as a, became an officer going through ROTC, goes into World War II, serves with the OSS behind enemy lines. He dealt with the communists before World War II, during World War II with the French Resistance. After VE Day, he goes to Manchuria. Hazardous Duty? Hazardous Duty by John K. Singlob I, the one, the only. Then he was in Spec Ops in Korea. He was Chief SOG for two years. He was our supervisor. Yep. And he's the kind of guy, when they came out with the uh, Skyhook, yeah. he said, before any of my men do it, I want to do it. Nice. So he tested on him, and <laughs> so he, he did it. He hooked up, and he told the Air Force pilots, when you pick me up, Go over to South China Sea. Do not turn left and go west, because the Viet Cong will shoot at my ass. Air Force officers, being what they are, turned left, took him over to the jungle, and he got his ass fired up by the Viet Cong <laughs> on a first skyhook in Vietnam. Guys, if you don't know what a skyhook is, you've seen it in the movies. You, you have, have. You saw it in James Bond. Yeah, James Bond. The it was James, also in the Green Beret as well. Yeah, that's the movie, true. The Green Beret. Oh, that movie too. A Thank lot you. Of people haven't Thank seen you, Rick. it, Rick, because we're old. We're sh uh, they've probably seen it in the Batman movie, um, but. True. Uh, uh, it's a fixed-wing aircraft cargo plane, C-130, basically, with a fork on the front. You on the ground with your stabo harness. You, you basically inflate a balloon. It goes up several hundred feet. And this plane comes by. The V on the front basically catches this bungee cord and then takes off. And you get pulled up out of, <laughs> out, off the ground, zero to hero. So if the plane's doing 120 knots, you're basically going from standing there twiddling your thumbs to 120 knots <laughs> like, like that. And uh, you want to talk about an opening shock of a parachute? Oh, yeah. I have had halo shoots open so, so fast and so hard, my leg straps basically stop where my nipples are. And <laughs> I just want to sing Moon River. It's like, ooh, ooh, yo. I can't imagine doing the sky. It's an opera dude. star, huh? Oh, my God. <laughs> Singing soprano. I actually know a guy. He was my first sniper mentor, a E7, um, back before Desert Storm. He'd gotten out for a while. He was an old uh, Vietnam vet. Sergeant Reed uh, was his name. I don't even know his first name because I had to call him Sergeant the whole time. He was a million years old. His first old. name was Sergeant. Uh, yes. His first name was Sergeant. He only That's had funny. one lung because he'd been shot in the back with an RPG-2. It didn't explode. Ooh, really? And uh, that's a good story, by the way. But um, he did the skyhook once. It was him and his buddy. And um, they'd set up the balloon, and his buddy got down it into the rice paddy the duck down trying to hide because they, they, the, the bad guys were nearby. And he's like, no, um, I just put on my last pair of dry socks. I'm not getting them wet. So he <laughs> stood on top of the rice dike. And uh, when the plane came by, they got, then they'd never done it for real before. But when they got yanked up the altitude, uh, he, he's like, I, I remember floating there behind the plane, looking down and my buddy and he, it, my buddy didn't have his boots on, the mud in the rice paddy, and it pulled him out of his laced-up boots, shattered all the bones in his feet and no. shit. Fucked his feet up, excuse my language. 
But uh, Ooh, <laughs> damn. Like, wow. I'm like, nah, I'm, I'm, I'm good with just doing stabo and rappelling. Y- y'all can keep that skyhook stuff. Oh, yeah, I don't oh, yeah. do it, dude. No. And guys aren't stupid. They know when they're standing there on the ground with this, <laughs> this cable going to the sky. They, don't, they know yeah. it's coming. Yeah. They oh, know. Yeah. They're not dumb. They're like, this is going to suck. Ooh. <laughs> you ever do a skyhook? No. no. <laughs> See? Uh, he no. said, nope. No. no. Not, we're not going to do Halo. If, if I can avoid Skyhook, thank you yeah. very much. <laughs> oh. Just give me a King Bee. I'm happy with the King oh. Bees. <laughs> That's awesome. Oh, my God. That's why my book is going to be called War Stories, a Comedy. Because this shit's fucking hilarious. It's yeah. funny, dude. This shit's funny. Oh. Oh, yeah, absolutely. Brother, um, (laughs) honest, I I consider it just a a total honor to get to just sit and just bullshit with you and to have Rick here with us over the phone. Thank you so much, Carl, for the invite, Uh, brother. Dude, this this is awesome. It's really awesome. I like being in the middle. This is cool. Yeah. I like it. like it a lot. Uh, Absolutely. This is is great stuff. We'll We'll have to get Jocko to come play with us, too. We'll, we'll get work the, on that. We'll get the uh, the seal <laughs> side of this story. Y'all actually had a few seals in Mac Sog, didn't you? Yes, they they ran missions more of the coastal stuff. Yeah, and uh, of course they um, that's where two of the Medal of Honors came for seals that had g- gone up north, and uh, uh, one of them was uh, I forget his rank as an officer was was a uh, uh, an ensign maybe, but it was Norris. And semen. Norris went in. Seamen. They're all seamen. Yeah, you know, there see we go. It. They're all seamen. <laughs> Sailors galore. But they, <laughs> this guy was good. This was the true version of the um, Bat 21. It wasn't. Oh, really? Okay. It wasn't yeah. helicopters that went in and yeah. got him. It was Norris going in with the Vietnamese guy from, from Sog. Kiet was lost, his name. Lost his eye. Yes. Right. He lost his eye yeah. during the process. But they saved the pilot, got him out. And then. Uh, Six or seven months later, a SEAL saved Norris when he was down. No shit. Yes. And I kind of drawn a blank on his name, Mike. But the other SEAL who got the Medal of Honor saved Norris's life. They, Norris eventually got the Medal of Honor. And then Mike, who I apologize for drawing a blank on, got the Medal of Honor for saving one. It's the only time that a future Medal of Honor recipient was awarded for saving a guy who got the Medal of Honor. That I'm aware of. I mean, my history lessons are a little bit short, and my synapses are shrinking. So, indeed. Hey, hey, hey John, if, if yeah. I remember the, the story right, the uh, Norris is recovering in the hospital, and they said, looks like you can't be a Navy SEAL anymore. What, what do you want to do? And he says, I, I want to I join the FBI. So they went to the director of the FBI and said, uh, and the guy said, hey, if he can make everything, you know, we're not we're not pulling any uh, we're not lowering any standards. If he can make all the standards, so dude did a second career in the FBI with nice. one eye. Look what I got no right kidding. here, guys. I last time I had John on, <laughs> last time I had John on, um, we did a coin exchange, and um, I thought that was pretty badass. Uh, I don't have very many of my coins left. I don't. Um, but brother, I just wanted you to know, I can't carry your coin in my wallet and, and be a poser. That's not me. So <laughs> I have my SF coin that I from my old unit that I guys. This is my old unit coin. Uh, it's got the quote from uh, President George Bush: "We will bring you to justice, or we will bring justice to you." Amen. On the back of it, and um, I have to have that. But uh, I just want you to know, brother, I keep this coin um, near and dear because uh, literally you're you're one of the you're one of the legends. Uh, well, because of that meeting you and I had here in January, I've upgraded my coins. You got a new coin. I got a new RT Idaho coin with my name on it, and this is for you, sir. Dude, we I don't ha- have another coin to give you. That's okay. We have some guys in the chat that helped you out with that. It's Mike Thornton saved That's Tom it. Norris. Thank you for people saving my shrinking synapse. Remember that. Yes, indeed. Thank <laughs> you for helping us out there. I appreciate that. Uh, that was Deputy that Dog and your, some others. That's your actual team. That's right? our team patch, which 
all happened after I left Vietnam. We were too busy running recon. <laughs> too busy to worry about that. Let me see Jets, that, Carl. Uh, I, I, this one ain't yours, dude. I'll tell you what I'm going to do, though. No. Um, I'm yes. going to take, take this one because it's just been replaced. <laughs> uh, I'm going to keep this one. Yes, yours. Because uh, nobody deserves to have two of your coins. Let's give one of your coins away uh, to the guys in the chat room. Let's do it. And all right, um, you guys know the deal. You put TR. Nah. In no. I don't want to do it. Let's do. <laughs> let's do S O G. S O G. You guys put S O G. Not yet. In, I don't do you it got, yet. Hold you gotta on. Let, let you me gotta do let it mods first. be in. The keyword will be S O G. Hold on. Let Chad put it in. Relax. Relax, guys. Relax. S O G. Yeah. O G. All right. Now. Um, John Stryker Myers coin um, with my DNA on it. Indeed. My Damage. DNA all <laughs> over it uh, to be used against me in a court of law. It's a licky sticky. No, dude, that's, that's just badass, dude. That, no, is, well, bad, no, that is badass. As we move forward here, those that we work with and appreciate, particularly within the Brotherhood of SF, that's the coin I want to hand out to those. Dude, that is, that is cool. That is and Someday very, very we'll cool. get to Sergeant Major Lamb. Guys, I, um, if you're one of my patrons and you go back through uh, our uh, patreon.com, I've told you about Patreon in the past. Uh, we we do a new story time uh, <clears throat> video once a month. We do a quick shooting tip. We do all this other stuff. Uh, but one of those is a, I actually did a video tour of my man room. And when you go around my man room, there are coins that are stacked the whole chair rail all the way around the room. And every one of those coins has got a story behind it. I, I got one that says 60 minutes. <laughs> right? That's gay, right? 60 minutes. Who wants that coin? Oliver North gave me that coin in Baghdad while he was working with 60 really? minutes. So uh -huh. every one of my coins has a story <laughs> behind it. Some stories better than others. But I've got a, I've got this one three foot section of wall where I put all my VIP I've seen coins. It. Indeed. And um, it's huge. This is where I'm going to put this one right here. This is where I'm going right. to put this one. This coin, though, I'm giving this one to one of y'all. Giving it to one of y'all. Y'all don't get my good one now. <laughs> I'm keeping that one. And what charity will the donation go towards? All right. Um, we're going to wait for Chad to come back. Indeed. We'll do a giveaway. And um, yeah, that's good stuff. Rick, I, brother, I don't have a coin for you. I don't. No, uh, did we lose us. Rick? We lost Rick. Oh, no. Oh, I'm, I'm still here. Yes, I, you were on mute. You, you were, you were, uh, I, I, exactly. you were in the well, fridge. I'm, he was in the I'm fridge. Actually, um, I'm actually, I'm putting helmets together. <laughs> Are you really? What so, kind of helmet? Yes. Which war? The, um, actually, uh, I've got two that are, um, they're, they're, they're the first, um, how was it, the Kevlars, the K-Pots. Okay, you know, you, so, you screwed me for Christmas because you told me to buy my son a World War II helmet, but you didn't tell me he, he couldn't have the welded D-rings to parachute with, so he couldn't parachute oh, with his. Yeah. Yeah, so <laughs> that's all right. So I have a spare helmet. If you know somebody that's looking for a used one, I got a Buford T. Justice. Don't do it <laughs> till 500 likes. How many likes we got here? <laughs> I don't need to do it to you guys. We've, we've got 477 likes. That's it. You guys realize we have watched 10,100 playbacks already. Um, and we've only got 482 likes. I think that's pretty sad. Times are tough. Uh, I invite you guys to crike yourself. You really need to take that pocket <laughs> knife and secure your own airway one four uh, one uh, four ninety eight. Come on, hit that like button. You Whack guys it. set the bar too low. Whack I want six hundred likes. Five oh six. All right. I want six hundred likes. No, 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 no. <laughs> yeah. don't don't be like that. Yeah, I'm gonna be it's like that. Coin. That coin is epic. It They're is gonna work epic for it. Coin. Epic they gotta coin. work for it. Um. Uh. Man, I can't believe I just gave away my first coin I got from John Striker Myers. That's freaking crazy. for a good cause. Huh? For a good cause. Indeed. I, um, <clears throat> if you collect coins, this coin's for you right here. Um, right here, right now. Nah. All right, let's hit that winner, Chad. You can do it. Nah. Whack it. 
Nah, we we're only at 538. You're... You guys set the bar way too low. You want 600? Yeah, I want 600. Oh, that's wrong, dude. Because we had 300 likes 20 minutes into the show. All right, okay. All right. So that means there's 500 people watching, and mo most of them didn't hit the like button yet. There's been 10,000 playbacks already. That's pretty weird. Yeah. Uh, average watch time, 6 minutes and 18 Five, seconds. 546 <laughs> likes. You guys are going to have to do better than that. Come on. Come on, give me 50 more. Come on. I didn't even turn on the spam. All right. Oh. Hey, Carl, I, I noticed there was two dislikes or two thumbs down. Yeah. Uh oh. Yeah. We, we, we can we can track that. We can track them down, can we? We, we have the ability to do that. <laughs> Actually, we can. You'd be surprised, guys, what we can do on I the internet. I seen that hammer six. <laughs> it was scrolling by, but I saw it. <laughs> hammer six is good people. He is. All right, all right. I'm gonna draw hammer it right six. now. All right, we're drawing. Uh, oh, FL3B cheeky squirrel. F we know that guy. Three B Cheeky Squirrel. We know him. He's a regular. Is that right? He? Yeah. Uh, Cheeky Squirrel, you just won this coin right here. Um, yeah, I think that's pretty bad. We're huh? frozen on screen. All right, um, Chad. How does he get this coin? He knows how. No, 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 no. Tell the tell the people <laughs> in the studio audience. FL Three B Cheeky Squirrel. Send an email to tacticalrifemanwinner at gmail .com and we'll get that out to you probably by Christmas. If you're lucky, yeah. No, no, we're we're gonna <laughs> do some mail do here better. this weekend. I, I'm not time. gonna say that, that time the of the month. triple mag pouch that Leaf LeBlanc won three weeks ago is still sitting next to Chad's chair. Ooh. I'm not gonna say that out loud because that would be wrong. Yeah, yes, we don't want to say that. It's top secret. <laughs> <laughs> but you've been working oh, Chad pretty hardly. Oh, it wasn't rigged, Wayne Trotter. Trust me. Nightbot <laughs> is 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 a. Uh, we don't rig elections here, guys. Yeah. You know why? Because uh, the best man should always win. And tonight, it's cheeky frickin' squirrel. All right? Um, good stuff. He changed his name recently because it was F <laughs> FL3B. Uh, oh, I can't remember what it was. He did change it, though, recent. Because that's not what it was. FL3B, I want to say thank you for your service, brother. Um, sincerely, a yeah. lot of people... Join the military, but very few people join the military while their country's at war. We'll um, do it again. I didn't. I, I got to be honest. I joined the military in 1985. We were in a peacetime army. and um, But there's a lot of people that have joined here recently, and they knew, you know, hey, um, joining my ass is going to a combat zone without a doubt. So... How did CSM Meyer end up in spec? No idea who CSM Meyer is. Who is CSM Meyer? Never heard of him. Maybe he's teasing? Because he knew when I landed at FOB1, I'd been busted to E Deuce. <laughs> so I was a private E Deuce, and they promptly promoted me to PFC and said, Roll your sleeve up so what people you think you're as? a sergeant. E6. E6. This is the answer, yeah. E6. Three and a half years. People ask me my rank. I say PFC. <clears throat> Proud freaking civilian. There we go. <laughs> uh, All right. With this, we got one this one here. Uh, right here? It's, it's anonymous, but you can say it because he was smart. Uh, it says donating anonymously. The name. Uh, it's a blast having John, Rick, comma, Carl, and Chad on stream together. Great fun and stories. Got me sold on John's books on combat shenanigans. <laughs> Nikogi wear, Nikogu wear, Nikogu wear. Yeah, he knew I was going to slaughter his name. All right, anonymous donor, <laughs> Nikogu wear. Thank you so much, brother. You're not getting a coin. You know? It's all right. Thank you, Tyson. I'm okay not being on camera tonight. It's worth it. And then we got, uh, we got Command Sergeant Major Rick Lamb on oh, the phone, indeed. too. So. Yeah, all-star cast tonight. Chad, you make stud, sure stud. Secret Squirrel gets up. <laughs> Who is that? For Secret Squirrel. That's a new one, ain't it? No, that's the old one. Oh, okay. That's the old one. All right. Hey, um, hey John. Yes, sir. Did I tell you that uh, Spider Parks? Yeah. I, I met him uh, in Korea in 2016. I, I was over there. I was assigned to uh, Special Operations Command Korea. No kidding. And... Uh, I'm, I'm walking. Uh, they let you go I'm back walking. to Korea. 
Yes, it was awesome. <laughs> and uh, in fact, it was, it was a great, great way to. It was a great way to end it out. But the um, I'm walking across that bridge between uh, South Post and North Post there uh -huh. on Yongsan. Yeah. And there's a, there's an older gent, you know, and he's uh, he's walking across the bridge, and, and I'm I'm moving out because I'm late for something. And uh, so, so I go to I go to pass him, and I said something like, uh, I'm "Coming up on your left," and uh, and I notice he's wearing a sog hat. You know, he's got a hat with a with a sog thing on. It. Yeah. And uh, so, uh, so we strike up a conversation because because now he's keeping pace with me, right? Because he's not going to let me pass him. <laughs> <laughs> oh no, he's and he's still walking so, to this day. Spider Parks walks every morning. Oh. Man, I, I, I tell you, and uh, I had never met the guy before, but I mean, everybody knows Spider Parks, right? Oh, yeah. And uh, so I just said, what, you, what are you here for visiting? And he goes, uh, yeah, I just came back from Vietnam. And I said, no, no kidding, really. I said, what were you doing over there? He said, I was looking for, for my team. Yep. And, uh, and he says, I still got guys over there that, uh, and he says, I, 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 I met up with some you know, North Vietnamese guys that were in the same battle. That, uh, and, and he said, we, we didn't find them. And he said, but, uh, but we did get some good leads, so I'm going back. And, uh, you know, the first thing is, uh, you think, oh, oh yeah. Okay. You know, this guy's, this guy's just, you know, pulling my leg. And, uh, and then I said, what's your name? And he goes, spider parks. Yeah. <laughs> said, oh, sure. I know you. I know of you. Yeah. No. Oh of you. yeah. Awesome. Yeah. Still oh, yeah. fit. I mean, just, just amazing. Yeah. You know, he's, uh, he speaks five or six languages fluently. Damn. And, uh, Spider Parks is amazing, and then the people he went back for was uh, uh, Sergeant Lane, who was the one zero Spike Team Idaho, and then um, Robert Owen, Sergeant Owen. They were the uh, one zero and one one of uh, ST Idaho that disappeared. They went in. Wow. Uh, when I arrived at FOB one, that team took off, was inserted into a target, and they remained. They're amongst two of the fifty MIAs today in the Secret War. And uh, Spider had been on the team, had been promoted to a new team. He's going to be a, the uh, team leader. And then when Idaho got wiped out, they brought him back and made him a 1-0 of Idaho. And then I, that's how we had an opening for recon. And so I got my job, sadly. Two men disappeared and there was an opening. <laughs> and Spider had been the... When we went through training groups, Spider was the pitcher for our fastball team. How? So I was his catcher and played center field for him. <laughs> How is that a way to get welcomed into your new unit in the middle of a combat zone? Your position just opened up. Yeah. On this team. <clears throat> oh. <laughs> now, when I went back, when I went back for my second tour, I landed CCN at the end of October, November third. RT Maryland got wiped out. Three Americans KIA, team of uh, the Indigs escaped, and then ten days later, RT ASP with. Uh, Sergeant Ray and Sergeant Suber, uh, the entire team was wiped out. Mm. And it was like, welcome back to the Secret War. Yeah, exactly. Mm. What was it like coming back between those trips? When you came back, because uh, you, you said you went back a second time. Yeah. Did you come back on vacation? Did you get reass no, you I, reassigned I, back to the States and then volunteered to go back the second time? Volunteered, yes. Volunteered. Um, I got sent to 10th Group, which was just beginning to sink its roots at Fort Devens, Fort Massachusetts. Fort Devens, Massachusetts, yeah. And uh, all of our SOG guys went to Company D. Because of my MOS, I got stuck in a signal company, which was run by a couple of butter bars. Mm -hmm. It was horrible. I hated every minute of my time there. Literally drove to the Pentagon. Billy Alexander was the woman on staff at the Pentagon. You drove who, from Fort Devens, Massachusetts yeah. to the Pentagon just a bitch. Hey, I want to. I want to get reassigned. Yep. I had her bottle of wine that she liked. I had her flowers. <laughs> and when the doors opened seven o'clock in the morning, zero seven, I was there. Went in, saw Billy. I went back to the park a lot, took a nap, and I went back and got my orders. She had to cut them to go back to CCM. Clear base on Friday. The MPs came on Monday, but I was gone. <laughs> 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 And then we went back, and you know, quite frankly, I felt more comfortable at CCM with my recon team. Rick, you can't make that up, Evans. dude. You can't make it up. Um, I, I, I miss the old school so much. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So, um, <coughs> 90, wow. No, it would have been 97, 97, 98 time frame. Um, 
they brought back the remains of a gentleman from, uh, I want to say it was Laos or Cambodia. I, I, I apologize, I don't know right. the gentleman's yeah. name, I should. Um, but because he was a fifth group, got Mac V. Sog, but fifth group. Right. Um, fifth group sent a, a funeral detail up. Uh, it was upstate New York. Uh, we basically stayed on base at um, West Point. And then from there, we went to the to the funeral home and everything, got to meet the family and uh, their times. Oh, he's such a great boy. He was so awesome and everything. And I apologize, I don't remember the guy's name. Um, and uh, he had done a couple tours to Vietnam. Uh, same thing, same thing. He went back a second time and, um, and he recovered his remains. So we show up the day of the funeral and uh, we're, the, all we've got to do, it's easy, uh, carry them from the funeral home, put them in the, into the hearse, and then go to the Catholic church that's like a quarter mile away. Right. And then take them out of the hearse, bring them in, no big deal. Uh, well, we show up early in our class days. We show up like two hours early than when we were supposed to be there, which is already early. We show up two hours because we, we want to do one more rehearsal. We get there, and literally as we pull in, 400 motorcycles roll up, 400 Harley Davidsons roll up, and uh, they're all Vietnam vets. And fast forward, we get ready to bring this guy out of the funeral home, and they're like, "Hey, would you mind carrying him the whole way?" We're like, "What the hell are you talking about?" You know, they're right. like, "You'll see when you get outside." So um, we pop up. When, when everybody's gone, we open the casket to put a fifth group coin in. Right. And all that was in the <clears throat> casket was a Ziploc bag. There was a couple bones. There was some shrapnel in the, the guy's heel. That was how they identified him from uh, previous Purple Heart. And um, closed the casket. We bring it outside. And the Vietnam vets were all at position of attention, present arms, the entire way down the road, both sides of the road, the entire way to the Catholic Church, the entire way. Uh, we carried that casket, tears just running down everybody's faces, carried it the whole time. So we go to the, the wake afterwards, um, and you know the family and the reporters, are like, hey, he was such a great boy. A couple of his teammates were there, and uh, they were like, uh, I'm like, yeah, I heard he was awesome. They're like, awesome, he was a motherfucker. <laughs> I'm like, he was what? They're like, yeah, man, he was. Uh, and so I'm like, that's what I want. Tell me how this guy actually was. And they're telling me about all the crazy stuff you guys were doing. But apparently he went home, got out, gotten out of the army and was there in town. And um, two locals were running their mouth. And he literally beat these guys literally almost to death. Beat literally with an yeah. inch of death. And um, he went before the judge and the judge, like, why did you beat these guys that bad? And he looked at the judge and said, your honor, in my world, where I just came from, these guys would die for what they did. I, and he, the judge basically looked at him and said, I'm giving you a choice, prison or your ass goes back to Vietnam. He turned around just like you did, volunteered to go back to Vietnam, and um, he didn't come home until late 90s, late 90s. He came back in a Ziploc bag, and it's a great story. I'll save it for another day, um, the, mis the mission and everything that his teammates told me. I, d I don't, uh, this is, brother, I want you to talk, not me. Um, it's your show. Share... Um, Making that decision, knowing you're going back to a combat zone like that, just knowing, uh, dude, every mission you win on, I understand I got to go to the end of the next deployment, or I got to go to my time's up. Right. You volunteered to go back where every time you exfilled, you were under fire. Every you, time except once. Oh, <clears throat> the one sunny day. Except it was. the ones. Yeah. And you volunteered <laughs> to go back. Brother, that's... Uh, well, you know, that's the SF thing. We, we really are close to our little people. Yes. Our indigenous people we work with. And, you know, part of it was I felt guilty and I wanted to go back. That you got to leave and, and they then had to stay And then we also had... We knew the MPs were going to come someday. <laughs> and so the combinations. I, I don't want to take complete credit for... But 
when I went back, it was like, that's where I belong. And then uh, ran recon till April of 70. And then our commanding officer was a, uh, a West Pointer who was a tanker. And he was out to get all the medals he could for himself. And um, basically, he and I had words. He just said, you're out of here. You're done. I'm going to ruin your SF career. He didn't realize my, my uh, ETS was up in two weeks, expired time <laughs> in service. So I basically told him and the sergeant major to go fuck themselves. And we had the biggest party ST, RT Idaho ever had. The whole team passed out. And the last one up was Hep, my interpreter. <laughs> and he says, my... You need anything else? I said, no, Hep, thank you. He passed out right there in the sand. <laughs> so I picked up Hep, dusted him off, put him in bed, and left him, pulled guard duty for two weeks, came home. And I thought that uh, asshole had been put there just you know, so uh, maybe it's a sign of good time to go home. I did. Guys, I, I want this to sink in. If he hadn't been in trouble with his O, his <laughs> officer, um, you understand... <laughs> Brother, you would have you would have volunteered to stay. You would have extended the stay. Oh yeah, yeah. And in There's five no more years there, dude. I'm just glad you're here. That makes two of us. Yeah. <laughs> Only by the grace uh, of the Lord. <laughs> now, gents, uh, and uh, I understand. Um, yeah, there's ten thousand podcasts being done tonight, right now. I got that. And um, you know, if if you if you're not in Hollywood or you're not a professional basketball player, and uh, nobody values your opinion, uh, but uh, dude, there's you guys don't realize how lucky we are because uh, your family surely is like man, they're, they're, we're lucky to have we're lucky to have dad, we're lucky to have the husband here. But we as a nation, gents, you don't realize how lucky we are to have this fine gentleman here right now. Brother, dude, dude, man. Because it's all mine and you and, so, and Rick here. The next generation. Ah. It's all part of our dedication to SF and to our country. No, <laughs> not yeah, like it that. Is. That's a little Crazy different. Crazy stuff. Crazy you went stuff. where they sent you. Uh, yeah, we, <laughs> we went. We didn't. Uh, Crazy, crazy, crazy stuff. Gents, John Stryker Myers, uh, Across the Fence, uh, his other books. Um, if you just understand, once you pick it up, you're not putting it down. You're not, or if you can't read, not, just get an audio book. Yeah. Uh, there you go. <laughs> Kindle, have it on your phone, but they're on Audible, right? Yes, sir. They're on Audible. Um, the first two are, yes. The You want to talk about a fast road trip. You're, <clears throat> you're not going to be able to get through this book uh, in... Over six months, you're not. It's it's like a one day, two day read, and you'll be like those crazy ass son of a guns. Well, you had to be crazy to do so. That that's a prerequisite. <laughs> yeah, with, without a doubt, without a doubt, without a doubt. So, honey, if you're hey, up, hey, Cole. Yeah, Rick. You're, you're the. Uh, I I, I got to tell you my how I met John the first time. How'd you meet him? The uh, we were over at uh, I think we went out to uh, Shot Show, and uh, they had a uh, they they always have a black and tan. Um, you know, thing for the Rangers, but then uh, the Special Forces um, Green Beret Foundation. Right. They have a, they have a little thing as well. So, so John's there. He's, he's you know behind a table, and you know, they got books and stuff out. And uh, so I'm, I'm going through, and I and I, I grab you know behind the fence, and I, I look at it, and I'm thinking, yeah, I I gotta have this. And, and I see a couple of um, you know coins and, and some patches and stuff, and so so I'm loading up, right? And I got I got this stack of stuff. And uh, I'm gonna go to check out, and uh, John's there, and so I hand him a credit card, and he goes, "I I don't have one of those credit card machines or the other the whatever the square," and uh, and so so I start putting it back on the table, you know where I where I found it, and he goes, "No no no," he said, "Go ahead, go ahead and take it," and uh, he goes, Here, "Here's my card, and uh, you you just send me the money, and uh, you know to tally it up and uh, and just send me a check," and uh, so. I looked all over that that place until I found a cash machine because I thought a guy that uh, that's that humble, that's that honest, that's that trusting. Yeah. Uh, I, I need I needed to pay him on the spot. So, uh, but yeah, that was uh, that was the first time I met you, John. I've been I've been impressed ever since. Oh my God, I forgot about that, but now it all comes back to me. <laughs> and, and Rick, isn't it awesome that that's the caliber of guys that we've worked with our career? You know. Oh yeah. Dude, yeah. I remember the sitting, guys that made us who we are. Exactly. Yeah. I remember sitting in uh, 
Camp Fallujah, I had my little safe house um, for my A-team on the Marine Base, Camp Fallujah, right uh, just east of the city of uh, Fallujah in Iraq in 03, 04, 04. And uh, the op fund, you know, because we, we, we had all our money for paying op fund. We had all our money for paying sources, all that stuff. We had our, um, our Sade guys, um, our ASOC guys. We had everybody. Um, but I remember coming into the ops room and my warrant had a stack of hundred dollar bills, like five inches deep, <laughs> five inches tall, hundred dollar bills. That was op fund. And I didn't bat an eyelash that I could leave that pile of money right there. And I did not have to worry about a single guy on my A team even taking a single $20 bill, $100 bill, anything, uh, because that's how much we trust each other to stay professional. Now, we would spend op fund to accomplish the mission. We lived in the gray area. Right. I needed a crane once to move something. Yeah. I couldn't get a crane. The, mar the Marine mayor that owned the base wouldn't lend me their crane. It w they had a 30-day wait. And... Uh, can't buy a crane without fun you can't no i can buy steaks so <laughs> we went i sent my guy I, chris papard sent him down to baghdad international airport bought a couple bottles of blue label box of cigars bunch of steaks all this other stuff and i invent uh, invited the two marine generals and uh all their staff the head of kbr who by the way owned the crane brought them in for a steak <laughs> dinner Threw him a hell of a party and uh, busted out the blue label and the cigars. And at the end of it, while they were all leaving, of course, the Marine General shakes my hand and says, you know, uh, Master Sergeant, Chief, these were you two, man, this best steak I've had in a while. If there's anything you can do for me, let me know. And of course, you know, hey, just keep letting me borrow your, your, your drivers and gunners from his PSD. No, and he did. He would always let me borrow them. But when the KBR guy, who was like three people behind him, walked by, Master Sergeant, great steak, man. If I can ever do anything, man. When I shook hands with him, I did not let go. I'm like, as a matter of fact, I need a crane. When I came out for PT at 5.23 the next morning, because that's what the rockets would always wake me up between yeah, 5.21 yeah. and 5.23 every morning. When I came out the next morning... Damn if there wasn't a crane already parked operator in it. It was no. awesome. And that <laughs> is the gray area. The oh, op yeah. fund, taxpayers' money, used efficiently. Um, but, yeah, the caliber of guys that we work with, you, um, <laughs> Tom Major, Rick Lamb, uh, brother, uh, and I was telling, telling John at dinner uh, how I first met you in Djibouti. Oh. And then uh, you being my battalion CSM, and then Stu, uh, the old JSOC guy, saying, "No, this is that's not the real Rick Lamb. This is who Rick Lamb is." And um, uh, you're a hero, also, brother. You really are. And it's been a total it's blessing. Time. Me being uh, associated with great Americans, like everybody. Amen. Dude, I have worked with some awesome. Awesome guys uh, on my A team, without a doubt. I think there's, I threw one of them out of the army for being fat, and even he was a good guy. He really was. Um, and again, that was a peacetime army. So uh, yeah, I've had a I've had, dude. I've just worked with some great guys. I really what's, have. what's funny is I've heard the the crane story a couple times, and I finally met your warrant at that time, Chief Whistler. Yeah. <laughs> And, and he told me the other part of that crane story. And <laughs> you ended up having to get a crane a second time because yeah, well, the connex <laughs> that they had moved with the crane the first time, turns out the bad guys were using that to aim and were it actually was a white connex getting that, more <laughs> accurate fires on the camp because of the connex. That at. was their marker. They were aiming at my connex so that was stacked up oh, above no. our wall. So it's like they oh, you all can't make that up either. They all, yeah, no kidding, Rick. They all of a sudden had something to aim at. Yeah. I'm like, man, these rockets hey, are getting closer and closer. We need to get another crane back in here to take that back down. <laughs> it was funny because uh, your warrant, yeah. uh, Whistler, he was like, 
yeah, Carl didn't tell you that part, did he? He's like, no, no, actually, he didn't tell me that part. Thank you. Uh, Keystone Cops. Keystone yeah, if you Cops. want to hear a trust for money. Yeah, trust for money. Um, Red F will be one. All right. And John Walton was a great poker player. Okay. And he never <coughs> locked his lockers. And this, we're talking about the big wall lockers, seven foot tall, yep. wide, and deep. Yep. So one day... Uh, one of our guys, Tony Harrell, came up to me and said, hey, somebody just took $500. I heard him say he took $500 from John Walton's locker. So we go to John. He said, John, somebody just took $500 from your wall locker. He goes, oh, my God. So he goes back. We open up the door. The money was a foot deep. <laughs> he never locked his locker. He never worried about our guys taking any money. Yeah. And John scratched his head and goes, you know, I've been meaning to count this. <laughs> he never counted and somebody stole $500 he didn't even, couldn't even tell if 500 was missing from all the money he won playing poker <laughs> never going to get a chance to spend it never uh, alright we wrapping up are we yeah, done we're going to wrap this up for tonight guys we are coming up on the three hour mark I really? got to get this old relic home to his indeed his nice washing bride because tomorrow her horse arrives. Yes, you get the horse tomorrow. She is, my um, wife horses around. I'm sorry. <laughs> I, I need oh, you sorry. to bring your blushing bride up here in the next couple of weeks. She right? wants. She wants to come back. Uh, she does. Uh, Once we'll, the horse we'll is shooting, settled. we'll go kayaking. Uh, maybe not. Uh, ask her if she wants to go kayaking. She can't canoe. Uh, but we're definitely going to jump in the jeeps. We're gonna go to the hit the trail. hike in uh, the Elk and Bison Prairie. We're going to get her mind on other things, and uh, it's going to be awesome. Rick, you're still on the line, right? Yes, sir. Brother, you are always invited um, up here. You let me know what works out good for you. We have got uh, Angry American, Chris Weatherman, and uh, some of the other guys from Florida are coming up uh, right before Memorial Day. I look forward to having Rick Lamb and a bunch of other people up in July to film some more videos for you monkeys out there. Indeed. And um, But, John, uh, you are only an hour and a half away. Uh, like a bad this dream. Be, like a bad dream, I'll yeah, be back. Dude, you need, to, you need to come back. You need to come Indeed. back. And, and don't forget, Rick, if you're ever uh, 35 miles west of Nashville, or you too, Carl, Chad, if you're all invited you know it. to White Bluff, Tennessee, come White on by. Bluff, We're going to have that barbecue hooked up, hopefully within a week or so. Nice. And then we'll have a couple of pieces of cow or no lamb chops in my house, really. No <laughs> lamb chops? Just steaks. Or pork chops. <laughs> Just don't be feeding me a horse. Indeed. Yeah, indeed. That's I Mc told him McDonald's like, does that. She's getting the horse, but you know who's going to take care of the horse. It's like when, when my wife got her swimming pool. We knew who was going to take care of that swimming pool. Oh, no, she loves her horse. We do it all. I love you, honey. You know I do. Till next time. Till next time. Airborne. Right, um, Masalama, brother. You're awesome. All right. Take care, Rick. Thanks for coming, Rick. All right. Hey, thanks again, man. Thanks, Carl. Yeah, you take care, brother. John, you take care. Be safe. Airborne, likewise. All you guys out there in uh, dinosaur land, uh, I'm sorry if we didn't get to your questions tonight. I guess that just means we'll have to bring old John back again. It's going to be awesome. Y'all take care and shoot straight. <laughs>